her role until her successor is appointed. Ms Sturgeon acknowledged that the move might seem sudden, but denied that it was due to short-term pressures and said she'd been wrestling with it for some weeks. To those who do feel shocked, disappointed, perhaps even a bit angry with me, please know that while hard, and be in no doubt, this is really hard for me, my decision comes from a place of duty and of love. Tough love, perhaps, but love nevertheless for my party and above all for the country. The Labour leader has apologised on behalf of the party for its handling of anti-Semitism complaints under his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Sakir Starmer also confirmed Mr Corbyn will not stand for Labour at the next general election. The Equality and Human Rights Commission announced it will end its monitoring of the party after two years of finding it responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. Sakir Starmer said action, not just an apology, was needed. To all those who were hurt, to all those who were let down, to all those driven out of our party who no longer felt it was their home, who suffered the most appalling abuse. Today, on behalf of the entire Labour Party, I say sorry. What you've been through can never be undone. Apologies alone cannot make it right. Lancashire Police says there's still no evidence to indicate a criminal aspect or third-party involvement in Nicola Bully's disappearance. The 45-year-old has been missing for 19 days. She was last seen walking her dog along the River Wire after dropping her two daughters off at school. Detectives say Nicola was listed as a high-risk missing person due to a number of specific vulnerabilities. The lead investigator, Rebecca Smith, says the investigation is ongoing. I hope with all my heart that we find Nicola Bully alive more than anything. The likelihood is that Nicola has unfortunately gone in the river. However, I have to stress this because this has been continually misconstrued. I cannot be 100% certain of that at the minute because we are continuing. It's a live investigation and there is always information coming in. Union leaders have said further teacher strikes will go ahead after disappointing talks with the Education Secretary. Speaking after today's meeting, the General Secretary of the National Education Union, Kevin Courtney, labelled the government's latest offer disappointing and said there's nothing in it that's persuaded them not to go ahead with planned action next week. Parents know that their children's education is being disrupted every day and our action has a higher moral purpose, that we are, we are trying to get the government to invest in this generation of children, not just tell us they'll invest in a generation of children in the future, they need to invest in the kids in the schools now in order to help improve their education. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the fight to reduce inflation is far from over, despite the rate decreasing for a third consecutive month. Data from the Office for National Statistics shows the Consumer Price Index fell to 10.1% in January. That's down from 10.5% in December. The drop was largely due to the price of fuel and transport slowing. A boy and a girl, both aged 15, have been remanded into youth detention, charged with the murder of a 16-year-old girl who was stabbed to death in Cheshire. Brianna Jai from Warrington was found seriously injured on a pavement near a park on Saturday afternoon. She died a short time later. Cheshire Police says they're exploring whether the teen, who was transgender, was the victim of a hate crime. The two teenagers will appear at Liverpool Crown Court on Thursday. A British man who died in Ukraine has been named by his family as Jonathan Schenken from Glasgow. A family tribute on social media said he died as a hero in an act of bravery as a paramedic. He's the eighth British national known to have died in Ukraine since the start of Russia's invasion last year. The UK Foreign Office says it's supporting the family and that it's in contact with local authorities on the ground. 
A 19-month-old girl has been successfully treated for a fatal genetic disease with the world's most expensive drug. Teddy Shaw from Northumberland was born with a rare inherited disease called MLD. It causes serious damage to the nervous system and organs, dramatically cutting life expectancy. She's the first person in the UK to be given the treatment, which has a list price of £2.8 million. You're up to date on GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. But now, let's get back to Patrick. Oh, OK. Right, so Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has announced that she will step down after eight long years in the job. She made the announcement in a press conference in Edinburgh this morning and said that she'd been wrestling with the question of whether or not to resign for weeks. Unlike a lot of people who had... No, I won't say it. Responding to suggestions that she quit because of a backlash from her controversial gender reform bill, the First Minister insisted the decision, get this, was not because of short-term issues. I know there will be some across the country who feel upset by this decision and by the fact I am taking it now. Of course, for balance, there will be others who will, uh, how should I put this, cope with the news just fine. Such is the beauty of democracy. But to those who do feel shocked, disappointed, perhaps even a bit angry with me, please know that while hard, and being no doubt, this is really hard for me. My decision comes from a place of duty and of love. Tough love, perhaps, but love nevertheless for my party and above all for the country. I have spent almost three decades in frontline politics, a decade and a half on the top or second top rung of government. When it comes to navigating choppy waters, resolving seemingly intractable issues or soldiering on when walking away would be the simpler option, I have plenty of experience to draw on. So if this was just a question of my ability or my resilience to get through the latest period of pressure, I wouldn't be standing here today. I think she's doing a, a bang up job of trying to control a narrative that people are absolutely gutted about this, isn't she? But yes, Nicola, a lot of people I think are indeed coping just fine. Joining me now is GB News' political correspondent, Olivia Rutley. Olivia, I saw you had a, you had a, a breakdown, a catastrophic breakdown earlier on, and we've had to just get her on the airwaves. You're, you're not coping just fine at the minute, are you? But um, there are some reasons behind this. She's saying that it's not just to do with short-term issues. OK. But actually, the polling at the minute is not particularly good and uh, quite a lot of people wanted her out. Yes, there was a poll recently suggesting that 42% of Scots wanted her to stand down immediately and that wasn't the only bad poll result that she's had. The latest Lord Ashcroft poll, which, bear in mind, previous Lord Ashcroft polls have shown big support for independence and have been supportive of Nicola Sturgeon. But the latest one suggested that no to leaving the UK mm. was ahead by 12%, which is the highest we've seen for over a decade. And she talks about, she mentions a bit about the, the short-term pressure she's under there. Of course, the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, which has proved very unpopular indeed in Scotland, um, only, I think it was by a margin of two to one, uh, Scots don't support it. That's only one of the issues. We've also seen the NHS waiting lists. Mm. We've got uh, up 68% more people than before the pandemic now going private because of two-year waiting lists in the NHS. So there were all of these competing pressures hitting Nicola Sturgeon at the same time. And she was under quite a lot of pressure, not just from the electorate, but also from the SNP. There were those within her very inner circle who didn't like the fact that she was planning to turn the next general election into a de facto referendum. Mm. And that might have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Yes, indeed. And look, just throughout the course of the next... 15 minutes or so, I'm going to be speaking to the Deputy Leader of the Scottish Conservatives, a former member of the SNP and a constitutional expert. So we'll get the political angle on it from both sides, really. And also, of course, what this means now, the big questions about independence, Scottish independence. But another little thing that um, Nicola Sturgeon, well, was asked about, swerved, is there might be a couple of things coming down the road for Nick, mightn't there, that wouldn't have necessarily been things that she wanted to go through SNP finances, etc., like that? Yes, there is this awkward story, which was uncovered, I think it was, by The Sun on Sunday, of a £500,000 online fundraiser for the SNP. And it appears it's not quite clear where that money has got to. Right. So the police are 
questioning at the moment. It's not yet clear. Sturgeon avoided the question put to her by the BBC of whether she personally has been questioned. But that is a, an awkward question that's rumbling along. And, of course, she's still facing the fallout from the Salmond affair, which was a couple mm. of years ago. She was very close to Alex Salmond and, obviously, a huge scandal around him. And to what yeah. extent did she know the details? So there have been all of these competing mini-scandals, as it were, leading up to this. So although it seemed like a bit of a shock on the face of it, for those in Holyrood, the writing had been on the wall for a while. Exactly. Look, Olivia, thank you very much, as ever. Olivia Utley there, our political correspondent. I've been asking you to email me. Get those emails coming in. I'll go to those shortly. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Is it good riddance to Nicola Sturgeon? Joining me now is the deputy leader of the Scottish Conservatives. It's Megan Gallagher, MSP. Megan, thank you very much. Is it good riddance to Sturgeon? Well, I mean, I think um, what we've seen is Nicola Sturgeon um, obviously resigning earlier on today um, and she's left Scotland in a more divided country than when she entered office. I mean, I, I think we can best describe um, her leadership as her taking our eyes off the ball um, and that relates to the drugs death scandal, um, NHS waiting times, which has just been mentioned and failing to make education her number one priority. There is a certain irony, I think, that a female leader has potentially been brought down by, some would argue, failing to protect women's rights. Well, I think that's right. And I think we, we can all, you know, take, take recognition that the Gender Recognition Reform Bill has got something to do with this. It was a deeply unpopular um, policy. And as you say, Nicola Sturgeon failed to take into account the concerns raised by women across the country. And she even um, said that those concerns were not valid. So I think when you look um, at the, the position that she put herself in, she backed herself into a corner um, because she ended up defending the indefensible and I think this became clear at First Minister's questions during the exchanges between Nicola Sturgeon and Douglas Ross um, when it was clear that she found herself into she found herself in a political hole that she could just no longer get herself out of. The ground has in recent years never been more fertile for another Scottish independence referendum because you'd almost definitely win it this time round wouldn't you would you would you have a, a snap independence referendum tomorrow, you'd smash it out of the park, put it to bed forever. No, I mean, I, I, I want to see a government that actually focuses on um, Scotland's uh, priorities. I want to see, you know, an education system that's fit for purpose. I want to see our NHS waiting times down. I want to see people being able to access public services. And all of that has been... It, we've, not, we've not been able to do that under this SNP government because they've been so distracted um, by another independence referendum that they've, that they've just not prioritised what the people of Scotland want them to. What's the mood like up there now? Because I think it caught quite a few people on the hop. But I suppose the smart money is the notion that, despite what Nicola Sturgeon is trying to say, controlling this narrative, like, I know you're all in shock. I'm sorry, I'm doing this for the greater good. You will thank me for this later on. There are a few potential scandals brewing that no doubt she wouldn't want to be a part of, and she doesn't like to recall a lot of information, quite famously so. Uh, she might be forced to in some cases, given some of the financial issues that the SNP is facing at the moment. Is the mood up there that she jumped before she was properly pushed? I mean, I think there could be an element of that. I wouldn't want to speculate in terms of, you know, the, the, the certain um, headlines that have been um, emerging. However, you know, I think when we, we look at the overall um, recent um, attitude um, from Nicola Sturgeon towards how she's been coping with certain issues um, in the Scottish Parliament, I think um, it's, it's definitely not been the, the usual um, behaviours that's, that's been certainly, you know, of, of previous Nicola Sturgeon and how she would, um, how she would you know, perform in certain ways in terms of, you know, our FMQ performance um, or indeed, you know, how she would conduct herself doing press conferences, for example. Well, the Scottish Conservatives maybe do actually properly have stuff to get their teeth stuck into north of the border now. There'll be a bit of chaos with the SNP leadership election and, of course, potentially could even become the party of women as well up there, which appears to have been lacking, rather ironically, for some time. Thank you very much, Deputy Leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Megan Gallagher, there, MSP. Now, Austin Sheridan is a former SNP Glasgow City Councillor and he joins me now. Are you in mourning? 
I'm not mourning that. I'm, I'm disappointed. And, I've, <clears throat> and I believe that we're, this people were all kind of taken by surprise. I think that seems to be to be the mood of the nation. Um, I think that Nicola Sturgeon uh, could have went on longer. But as Nicola Sturgeon said in her statement today, you know, there were people there who felt she could have went longer, maybe people who are disappointed. But she has done it um, out of the love for, for her party and her country. Um, and, you know, there is nothing wrong uh, with fresh leadership. Um, I mean, already um, I've seen an array of potential candidates that could um, take over the leadership of the Scottish National Party, demonstrating uh, the vast talent that we have within our party. And, you know, the SNP is bigger than Nicola Sturgeon, even though um, I would argue she's been the best leader that we have had um, since devolution. Is that, is that um, a concern? Is that, would, do the public have a right to be concerned about the idea that Nicola Sturgeon is the best that the SNP has had to offer? Because if I look at it now, you know, the NHS, massive waiting time, 68% more people going private in the NHS north of the border. The support for Scottish independence appears to be tanking big issues when it comes to drug deaths still. We've also, of course, seen things like the attainment gap, which Nicola Sturgeon was actually quite fruity with the truth over when it comes to the gap between the poorest and the wealthiest in Scottish education. What is her legacy? Because, I don't know, is Scotland not worse now than when she took over? I mean, yet, despite everything you say, Nicola Sturgeon still remains the most popular leader of any political party um, in Scotland. Um, um, the SNP still lead um, in, the, um, in the polls that we would win elections and, indeed, um, increase our number of Westminster seats to the numbers that we have just now. I mean, uh, um, and, and, and what Nicola Sturgeon can be proud of, I mean, if you look at the way, for example, um, that, that she led us through the pandemic, and, and we had, like, the Tories trying to attack Nicola Sturgeon, um, you know, on that... Uh, on, on how she was handling the pandemic. But yet, yeah, she managed to achieve the highest percentage share of the SNP vote that we had ever recorded in a Scottish parliamentary election. So, I mean, understand that the opposition politicians will be they'll, they'll be a lot of mm. bluster. Um, you know, uh, um, they'll talk about how Nicola Sturgeon is, is unpopular. But, you know, time after time when the voters go to the polls, okay. Nicola Sturgeon well, keeps winning. Because people of, have elections the since 2010. Talking of the polls, Austin, I've got to ask, if someone offered you an independence referendum right now today, would you take it 12% behind in the polls? Do you know something? I would love an independence referendum right now because the thing about unionists in Scotland, right, is, is they aren't prepared to argue for the union. When, when, when I compare Scottish unionists to other unionists, such as Arlene Foster, for example, somebody who is actually passionate and, and she always wants to argue, um, you know, for Northern Ireland's place in the union and she's passionate about it. Unionists in Scotland aren't passionate about the union. They're scared of the debate. So the, the fact that they're scared and so unprepared absolutely makes me want to have one because okay. I'm confident that we would win. Uh, Austin, we've spoken a number of times about the gender issue, the trans issue. Despite what Nicola Sturgeon says, I think it's reasonable to say that it's done for her in the end, realistically. She couldn't say what a woman is and she's had to exit stage left. Will you now change the habit of a lifetime and tell me what a woman is, because if you says former SNP Glasgow City Councillor, if you want to make a political comeback, the the the, the mood today is that you, you're going to have to tell me what a woman is. Now, I'll tell you what, see, if anything in, 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 in the time that I've known Nicola is that if any issue would make her determined to stay in office um, in order to see these things through, it would actually be uh, um, um, be the gender um, recognition reform. Um, right now, um, politicians that are supportive of the legislation should be putting their shoulder to the wheel um, you know, to defend trans people and the wider LGBT community, which, of it, which, which, some, which have faced some horrible abuse and the I understand, right, that there's people out there that have got genuine concerns and they've not been abusive, and I've always argued that we should have a grown-up and reasonable debate. Uh, but unfortunately, there's been factions on both sides, um, you know, um, that haven't behaved in a reasonable manner. Uh, but no, you know, no, something no. Nicholas Ruffin is still going to what do is not, what an is MSP. Not, the SNP right, but are still would you not be concerned recognition now, reform, but we'll see it through. Whoever replaces Nicola Sturgeon, unless they can avoid this catastrophic issue and the never-ending questions about what is a woman and should male rapists be in women's prisons, they're going to go the same way as her. So, do you know, we'll just want no. someone to emerge who goes, right, look, woman, adult, human, female, no to male rapists in female prisons, and it all goes away and you can crack on focusing on independence.
Well, yeah, um, no to male rapists in female prisons. I think that's a no-brainer. I don't think you'll find anybody arguing otherwise. Uh, but, you know, in terms um, of the candidates that I have seen moving forward, you know, um, I am interested to see um, what, um, what it is they're going to bring forward, and I'm going to keep an open mind, but I'll make an exception for one candidate uh, that could potentially put herself forward, which is Joanna Cherry. Um, I think she's got a, you know, I, I think she's got a hope in hell, to be honest with you. Um, and I think that, you know, the SNP will choose will choose a progressive leader. All we right. will then go on um, right. to, to, to still deliver ge the gender recognition reform. We will go on to ban conversion therapy. Okay. Uh, we'll go on to change the justice system to help convict All rapists right. to protect women. And we'll go on to create buffer zones around the abortion clinics so that All women right. can I access take your those point. services I'm... without fear and abuse. I'm going to have to rock and roll on, I'm afraid, Austin, but I always appreciate our little back and forth. Thank you very much, my good man. Well, Austin Sheridan you, there, Patrick. former SNP, Glasgow City Councillor. Loads of you getting in touch. Keep your views coming in. GB views at gbnews.uk. At last, our nation can rejoice that the union might stay together. That's from Keith. Right, you're with me, Patrick Christie. Don't go anywhere because we've got plenty to get stuck into. Within the next 20 minutes, I will tell you in a GB News exclusive what the extreme measures people smugglers are now going to in order to avoid border force, which is putting those trying to get to the UK small boats in even more danger. And are Lancashire police now playing the blame game because they claim that false information, basically the public in a way, are actually responsible for, well, some would argue, a bit of a ropey investigation into Nicola Bully. Back in a tick. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit up. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is another big one because the UK's maritime rescue services are being warned that they're likely to see migrant boat crossings over a much wider stretch of the southern coastline in the year ahead. GB News can reveal people smugglers are increasingly launching small boats much further south along the French coast to try to avoid more robust police patrols around the Calais and Dunkirk area. So new routes, people, and it opens up a much wider stretch of that south coast. Our Home and Security Editor Mark White has this report. <laughs> Racing out from the French coast, a local lifeboat crew responding to reports of a small migrant boat in difficulties. But this incident, also involving a French border patrol vessel, is far away from the usual small boat routes out of Dunkirk and Calais. In fact, we're south of Boulogne, more than 50 miles from those routes. It's one of dozens of rescues the lifeboat based in Berk has attended in recent months. A major uptick in activity as people smugglers attempt to avoid increasing police patrols further north. The numbers have been rising. At the end of 2021, we were involved in many migrant rescues. During 2022, there were significantly more migrants. The further they have to travel by boat, the higher the risks. Travelling from down the coast brings extra dangers. Being in the water for longer brings the danger of hypothermia and even being hit by bigger boats. For the people smugglers, increased police activity around Dunkirk and Calais has made their regular launch points more difficult to operate from. French authorities are also busy erecting miles of extra security fencing around those beaches, and that's driving the small boats further south. For years, the criminal gangs have predominantly used the shortest route to the UK, pushing off first from the beaches around Calais, then expanding to include areas near Dunkirk. While occasional boats have been launched further south, in the past six months, this route using beaches near Boulogne, has seen a significant spike in activity. With a beach even further south, near Fort Mann, also now regularly being used. And for maritime patrols in UK waters, that means a far greater likelihood that small boats will begin showing up on a much longer stretch of UK coastline in the year ahead. It'll mean rescue teams across a wider area being called out more regularly to boats that have been in the water for many hours. It does put a lot of pressure on the, the resources. You know, these boats are constructed for one purpose, to shift mass numbers of people. But they're designed, you know, constructed very poorly. They're not expected to be standing up to any real sea conditions, the amount of, of people that they are uh, loaded with. So by crossing from further south and spending longer at sea, every second that they're at sea longer than they need to be is just going to increase that risk and that chance of, of, another, of another disaster. There's little doubt, say maritime rescue experts, that those making small boat crossings from further down the French coast will be at far greater risk with predictions that up to 80,000 people could attempt to cross in the year ahead, authorities on both sides of the channel will be stretched to the limit. Mark White, GB News. Well, the man himself is right here next to me in the studio. And, Mark, the fact is now that more parts of the UK are going to be opened up to arrivals, aren't they? Yeah, because clearly when these boats are coming from further south, it's a big old stretch of water there, you are opening yourself up to southwesterly uh, winds from the fast-moving tides, you could end up anywhere. Mm. I mean, one of the uh, plus points as far as those trying to navigate across from the shorter distance between Calais and Dover is that you can pretty much see from the French side the landmass mm. uh, of the Kent coast, and you can see prominent landmarks like television towers, which they are asked to steer towards the lights of the television mast. So, 
Mm. Uh, you don't get that when you're further south and it's a much more expansive piece of sea. It's over the horizon, so they can end up anywhere. In fact, the, uh, the gentleman there from the lifeboat service in Breck, who was doing the interview with us, said that they are being called to instances where migrant boats are just out there going round and round in circles because they're lost effectively. Yeah, indeed. And I think as well, obviously, it's much more difficult for us to police. It's much less safe for the people who are on the boats as well. In terms of the different geographical locations of the south coast that it, it could open up, well, where are we talking about, roughly? Well, we're, we're talking about uh, quite a bit south of Boulogne. Uh, so it's about 60 miles plus away from the beaches of Calais and Dunkirk, where they're heading off just now. And the reason is simple, it's just because we are seeing more and more police officers up in that area, partly, I think, due to the fact that we're giving mm. them millions of extra pounds to put more police officers there on those beaches around Cali and Dunkirk. There's miles of extra security fencing going up there, all designed to make it a bit of a hostile environment for the people smuggling gangs. So what do they do? They just mm -hmm. head further south. I mean, some would argue potentially this is a sign that at least something is working. They're having to move, they're having to try different tactics. I suppose the proof will be in the pudding when it comes to how successful these tactics are. Mark, I will talk to you again very shortly. Thank you, Mark White there. GB News is home and security. Editor, you're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Next, has the blame game started? Because Lancashire police claim that false information, accusations and rumours from the public are distracting them from their work to find missing mum Nicola Bully. I think it's an interesting take, that, frankly, if they plan on keeping the public on side. I find that quite surprising. And will they? Won't they? Do we even care? The mystery over whether or not Harry and Meghan will attend the King's coronation is in the balance, as apparently they are yet to decide. Find out what their thought process is going to be very, very shortly. If they do jump on a plane and grace us with their presence, will they be welcomed? No. But right now, it's your headlines. Patrick, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 33 minutes past three. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Nicola Sturgeon has resigned as First Minister of Scotland after eight years in the job. Speaking at a press conference at Butte House in Edinburgh, Ms Sturgeon said she was proud to have served as the first female and longest serving First Minister of Scotland. Ms Sturgeon acknowledged that the move might seem sudden, but denied that it was due to short-term pressures and said she'd been wrestling with it for some weeks. To be clear, I'm not expecting violins here, but I am a human being as well as a politician. And the nature and form of modern political discourse means that there is a much greater intensity, dare I say it, brutality to life as a politician than in years gone by. All in all, and actually for a long time without it being apparent, it takes its toll on you and on those around you. The Labour leader has apologised on behalf of the party for its handling of anti-Semitism complaints under his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Sir Keir Starmer also confirmed Mr Corbyn will not stand for Labour at the next general election. The Equality and Human Rights Commission announced it will end its monitoring of the party two years after finding it responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. And Lancashire Police says there's still no evidence to indicate a criminal's aspect or a third-party involvement in Nicola Bully's disappearance. The 45-year-old has been missing for 19 days. She was last seen walking her dog along the River Wire after dropping her two daughters off at school. Detectives say Nicola was listed as a high-risk missing person due to a number of specific vulnerabilities. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Patrick will be back with you in just a moment. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236 and UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio with the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on Well, you are. You, 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 no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Where is Nicola Bully? That's the big question on a lot of people's lips today because the search remains ongoing. The working hypothesis is still that she unfortunately has gone into the river. But Lancashire Police gave an update on the investigation earlier, saying that they were sharing more information than they normally would. And the Assistant Chief Constable, Peter Lawson, emphasised that there was no evidence to indicate that there was a criminal aspect to this case. I would emphasise that it remains the case there is no evidence to, in, to indicate a criminal aspect or third-party involvement in Nicola's disappearance. However, the, the officers involved in the investigation are the same experienced specialists and many senior officers who are concerned with the investigation of the most serious and complex crimes. That is the importance and focus we have given to the investigation to find Nicola. It's important to say that our activity has at every stage been directed by expert trained police search advisors who we term pulsers and they've been following a nationally recognized doctrine around search strategy yeah one thing that was interesting was there is a bit of a blame game starting now which is seeing essentially the police starting to point the finger at the public a bit and going well you've been distracting us with wild theories etc for me that doesn't quite hold water because it's actually the family of Nicola, who appears to have been interacting with the press and the public a lot more than the police. Joining me now is the editor of Lancashire Post, it's Nicola Adam. Nicola, thank you very much. Can I tell, what did you make of that statement from the police officer there, who was essentially saying the public have been distracting the police here and potentially having some negative impact on their investigation? I thought that was odd. Yeah, I mean, there was an element of the word misconstrued was used multiple times about the press and the public etc. Um, I think perhaps they need to rethink the way they're communicating that because actually I do think people think they're helping in oh. the main. I think most people are trying to help. Okay. I mean, my inbox here in Lancashire, you can imagine, I, I'm, my inbox is full of all sorts of people with theories and things, you know, and we're, we've taken a line here at the Lancashire Post that we're sticking to the facts and, you know, not the speculation very much so. But Yes, there's a lot around and people do have theories, but a lot of people genuinely think they can help, you know. Um, you yeah. know, it, it goes through the, there's across, some people genuinely have bits of information, which, you know, we're certainly passing on to police, and whereas others, you know, so some people like pet psychics and this kind of thing, a lot of these wow. kind of people coming on with solutions, which perhaps are not so practical. And I do understand that the volume of information the police must be getting must be you know, enormous yeah. um, and a lot to handle and not something they're used to dealing with. I do, I think there is that. And, and I do think the police are handling it fairly well, to be honest. But I think, yeah, you're right in that. I don't think blaming anybody for anything at this stage is going to help anyone. I'm going to return to the police and how they may or may not be handling this in a second. But they, they keep using this line of specific vulnerabilities. It was, it was a, a, a high category missing person case because of specific vulnerabilities. Do we know what that really means? 
Um, well, we don't at this stage, but I mean, the indication was there right from the very beginning that there was something else they wasn't telling us simply because if some a person goes missing, normally they would there would be a, a kind of waiting period first. They'd normally give it like 48 hours before they swing into full investigation search and kind of communication to the press mode but this was very fast this suit within an hour of nicola going missing being reported missing by her partner they'd started the search they'd started putting out missing from home notices on social media into the press which was very fast so really it was always the clue was always there that there's more to this than quite meets the eye what yeah. exactly those possibilities are and so they're, they're trying to keep private but obviously you know, that's just going to lead to more speculation at this stage. Well, this is the thing, and it's such a difficult case not to speculate on, and every single person obviously wants to have the respect for the family and for Nicola and for the police as well, mm -hmm. frankly, but we are here now, day 18, 19, I lose track, frankly. But it's incredibly difficult not to speculate because it just seems so mysterious, and it leads to the question, how can someone just drop off the face of the earth and what are the police not telling us on why and in case of the in the case of the specific vulnerabilities that's something that is bound to get people talking as indeed we were now can i ask you will you will know a lot more about lancashire police frankly than i would imagine most people what's their form like when it comes to being able to solve cases that are similar ish to this well it's actually pretty rare for something this high profile and this large to come to lancashire um, usually, I, I can only imagine, like in this case, like in other cases, they would have had to have some input from outside, um, from the National Crime Agency, etc., who I think they have consulted. Um, so it's been a while, actually, since they've had something like this, too. So I can't really say, oh, you know, they're fantastic at this or whatever. Um, they are certainly not got a reputation for being bad at things. So at this stage, I think we just have to keep an open mind that they know exactly what they're doing. Nicola, thank you very much. Always an absolute pleasure. And uh, I know that you've been all over this story from start and uh, I nearly said finish, but it's a long way from being over by the sounds of things. So thank you very much, Nicola Adam there, who is the editor of the Lancashire Post. And of course, if you're not watching GB News or checking out the latest on our website, it's well worth going to the Lancashire Post for the stuff that's bang up to date. Right now, back to our top story, the news that Scotland's first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, is to resign. After more than eight years in office, the SNP leader confirmed that she'd been wrestling with the decision for weeks and that she knew in my head and my heart that this was the right time to step down. But why is she really going? Is now really the right time? Did recent pressures play any role in her decision to quit? Controlling the narrative is a... Well, it's the, it's the right of anyone who's in politics and is the right of anyone who's giving any speech whatsoever. You want to control the narrative, don't you? She was at pains to say it is not due to short-term pressures, which I think most people can read into the fact that it probably was a bit to do with short-term pressures. To break this down further, I'm joined now by Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh West, Christine Jardine. Christine, thank you very, very much. Are you mourning the sad loss of Nicola Sturgeon? Um, actually, I was surprised at my reaction today because uh, Nicola Sturgeon has been a huge figure in Scottish politics since, well, at least since she was elected in 1999. So while you know I have agreed with very little that she has said, particularly about independence, and mm. um, we've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe over the referendum um, nine years ago now, I, I respect the fact that Nicola Sturgeon is a hugely talented um, politician who will be a sad loss to her party, most of all, but to Scottish politics. Someone that okay. talented, you do not want to lose from from the scene. And, you know, it's, you know part of me is sad to, to see her go, and I have a huge respect for her. So let's start with possibly the good news for you in terms of the independent side of things. Do you, do you think that Nicola Sturgeon going and what's inevitably about to happen now with the SNP, leadership elections, etc. Whoever comes in to replace her will not be as iconic a figure as Nicola Sturgeon has been, OK? So is it a good thing for people who do not want to see the breakup of the United Kingdom? Well, you'd be surprised to know that that is not actually what is at the forefront of people's minds in Scotland at the moment. Independence is not the main issue. The main issue in Scotland at the moment is the fact that our NHS is in a perilous condition, our education standards are falling, our public services are on strike, there are potholes everywhere in our roads, they're terrible. These are the things that people are actually concerned about in Scotland at the moment. So whether or not it will make any difference to the independence debate is an issue for the SNP. And 
you know, I think that in general terms, it will be difficult for them to find someone with the political savvy, the cachet, and the just the experience of Nicola Sturgeon as quickly. Because remember, she was deputy first minister for a number of years under Alex Salmond, and she ha is one of those now rare beasts in Scottish politics who had been in the Scottish Parliament since it was set up in 1999. So her experience um, yeah. is you know, is irreplaceable. And let's not forget that whatever else has happened in Scotland over the past eight years, Nicola Sturgeon was hugely significant in coping with the pandemic in Scotland. Her influence, her reassuring figure every day um, at her press conferences was completely different from what we were getting from England. It's, it's interesting. I, I wonder how many people who saw Nicola Sturgeon popping up in their front room every day, thought it was particularly reassuring. But I'll have to take your word for that, Christine. Look, the element, well, of, the, uh, right, the element of potentially bad news uh, for you, I would, I would suspect, is that a big thing, some have argued the straw that broke the camel's back with Sturgeon, is on the gender recognition stuff and the idea that she, a female leader, couldn't tell us definitively what a woman is. If you want to secure your place at the heart of Scottish politics, are you now going to have to come up and say, let's end this madness? Tell me what a woman is. That's not what this is about today. What we're talking about today is the fact that Scotland is looking for a new first minister and that we have an important position as leader of the SNP and of uh, first minister, which is going to steer politics in Scotland for mm. the next at least four years until the next election. Now, that is what is important to all of us today. That is what is significant. And that is what we are looking at. The individual issues we will talk about individually and separately. There are a number of issues which have divided the SNP and are dividing the country. But today, what we're thinking about is we didn't expect this. Nobody, I don't think, expected I, her to resign. I, I disagree. It's, Look, certainly I'll... not. I'm sorry, so I, I disagree because when I, when I, and I think a lot of people realised that Nicola Sturgeon was going, the first thing that I thought of, and I know a lot of people did as well, is she's going because she's made an absolute horlick to the gender recognition stuff. I mean, you could put it all to bed now and distance yourself, the Liberal Democrats, from what has been an absolute horror show for the SNP over this by just saying that uh, what a woman is. It has been a horror show for the SNP. I'm not. I'm not denying that they have managed it incredibly badly. But you. But, but you think you have the I same am, views on it, though. Let, let me finish. Let me finish. I am out every day of the week that mm -hmm. I am in Edinburgh talking to people in Edinburgh and what they care about. And I know that what they care about is the cost of living crisis. It's mm -hmm. the cost of energy. It's the state of our NHS. It's the falling standards in our education and, oh, and the the conditions we're expecting teachers to work in. That is what people who uh, oh, vote right. in Scotland, who live in Scotland, care about. And if you're looking for what has been the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon, then you will have to look at her record as a whole. One of the things she did say was judge her on okay. education. And that was yeah. brought up today at the press conference. It was, it was. You are not necessarily wrong in all of that you said, but it is interesting that we are still swerving the old genesis. But look, Christine, thank you. Thank you very much. Always I a pleasure. I made a mess of it, did I not? What was that, sorry? I did answer you. I did say I think they've made a mess of it, did I not? Well, you did say you did say that. Yes, you did. Thank you very much, Christine. All right. Oh, gosh, I feel like I've been told off. Christine Jardine, now, who is the Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh West. There we go. Right, now, what happens next? Because the other big issue, let's be honest with you, apart from all the gender recognition, male rapists in women's prisons, Sturgeon's record on the NHS and potholes as well, which reared its head there, is, of course, the wider issue that affects every single person living in the UK, and that's Scottish independence. So what does it really mean for that? Joining me now is lecturer in law at Bangor University and constitutional expert is Dr Craig Prescott. Dr Craig, thank you very much. You've got a, fa a fabulous bookcase behind you there, so I'm expecting you to be incredibly learned on this topic now. So what does this mean for Scottish independence then? Well, I think this may point to an idea that w we may have reached peak SNP um, in that, you know, they've had an astonishing run in a whole series of elections since 2014. Nicola Sturgeon perhaps has been part of that as leader. And, you know, how many people voted for SNP because mm. Sturgeon was the leader, I think, is an interesting question, which we'll have answered in elections coming up. And I think the lack of any clear successor to Sturgeon, um, you know, sort of raises questions yes. as to what the SNP will do 
with the independence question because it just feels well, like there's no plan to go from here to independence now. No, well, I mean, she, divided. Nicola Sturgeon was trying to portray that she was a, a brick in the wall of Scottish independence. So she's the extra layer and then there'll be one or two more bricks and then bingo, Scotland will be free from the shackles of Westminster, a horrible, undemocratic place. And that's what she's trying to say. But she just leaves Scotland and in particular the independence movement, languishing 12 points behind in the polls, which is a sizeable gap. I mean, it sometimes was, uh, was, well, for the vast majority of the time in recent years, a lot less than that, wasn't it? So realistically, would now be a good time for the Tory government to go, all right, then, have an independence referendum. We'll win it. Put it to bed. Well, you may think that um, one of the dangers with referendums is that um, very often the polls shift during any sort of campaign period and you end up perhaps with a result that you may not want in the first place. David Cameron found that out in 2016. Um, and so I, I think, you know, referendums, you know, if you're trying to use them perhaps in the way that the UK government might be tempted to do, it can rebound on you very, very badly. So the UK government is probably wise to be cautious on this and say no referendum for now. Perhaps let this wave of, of SNP support play out over the mm. next few years and then the issue will diminish um, as support for independence may diminish. We also yeah. have to think about the next general election, which might see Labour do uh, particularly well in Scotland, may not get a majority of the seats, but might take many seats from the SNP. Yes. So this is perhaps a nice window for Sturgeon to leave on a relative high before the SNP sort of find themselves in perhaps greater difficulty in the years ahead. Yes, indeed. And in fact, you've hit the nail on the head there because almost like we planned it, a little bit later on in the show, I'm going to be speaking to the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland. So we'll get their view on exactly how well Labour will do or could do potentially now in Scotland. Look, thank you very much. It was indeed expert analysis, as we came to expect. That is a lecturer in law at Bangor University and constitutional expert, Dr Craig Prescott. Reassuring, I think. I took from that. Anyway, if you do not want the UK to break up, if you do not want Scottish independence, I do find it quite interesting that Nicola Sturgeon has done it at this particular time. What I do find fascinating is that she's going, well, it's not about short-term issues. Now, we know what some short-term issues have been. OK, a couple of scandals when it came to money that her partner gave to the SNP, etc. That's ongoing. She's also, of course, the Gender Recognition Act, which was allowed, at least in part anyway, a male rapist into women's prisons. That's kicked right off, and women will make up at least half of the voter base north of the border. And if you rile them up, then I suspect strongly that you're not going to do particularly well at the election. So I get all of that, but she's saying it's not short-term issues and that independence is still very much on the cards, which makes me wonder what is around the corner for Nicola Sturgeon. And there are, of course, a couple of potential issues looming. Look, loads of you been getting in touch. Paul says, I'm so glad she's going. It's only because she's finally realised that Scotland independence is not going to happen. Yeah, she's not saying that, but potentially. James says, maybe Sturgeon's departure is partly because she's had so much negative press regarding controversial issues. She's saying it's not that. I strongly suspect that there is something coming around the corner when it comes to, potentially anyway, things like SNP finances, etc. We will have to wait and see. The recent controversy, though, over the Queen Consort's crown has refocused attention on other contentious aspects of King Charles's coronation. That's right, we're moving on, people. The attendance of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, will they, won't they? I believe that I am joined now by uh, the wonderful royal commentator, Michael Cole. Now, Michael, uh, they say, Harry and Meghan, that they are assessing what the public mood is going to be like and then they will make their decision. Can we just cut it short for them and tell them exactly what the public mood is going to be like. It's going to sound like this, isn't it? Boo! <laughs> Patrick, Patrick, only 80 days to go now. I'm sure you're keeping your excitement in, in check at the moment and your invitation is probably already in the post. Of course, the king actually has played a blinder in this because he let it be known from the outset that his younger son and the younger son's wife, Meghan, were very welcome at his coronation. Now, that puts the ball very firmly in their court. If they decide not to come, that would look a little bit small-minded and uh, perhaps a little bit peevish. And, of course, if they do accept, 
uh, they leave themselves open to the charge of hypocrisy, having slagged off uh, merrily most of the members of the royal family in ways that were cruel and hurtful. Um, and so it's really up to them. The king has been, as I say, very clever. If you want my guess, which you haven't asked for, I rather suspect that he will come uh, and she will stay at home with the children. Mm. i be honest with you, Michael, I want them to come so they can see <laughs> how much the British public despise them. Is that unfair? No, well, it's interesting. I would always say that the British public, at a, a great occasion, would never boo. But that was given the lie at the memorial service or, or Thanksgiving service at St Paul's for Her Majesty the Queen's 70 years reign, where there was sporadic booing from the crowd. But, you know, more than booing, silence is a very much more powerful weapon. Mm. Uh, the cold shoulder has very much more effect. And yes. I think people will let themselves know. It was interesting, um, I know your previous guest, one of the many books behind him, was mm. Battle of Brothers by Robert Lacey. I did ah. notice that. Of course, that battle has turned very much more into a war. So the difficult uh, uh, relationships will be within uh, w between Prince William, now All Prince right. of Wales, and his brother. And how will they get on? And lots of other factors. Where will... Lots of other factors. Hide the dog bowls in case one of them gets smashed. Michael Cole, thank you very much. Royal commentator, always a pleasure, Michael. Great to see you. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Don't go anywhere, because I've got more on that farewell message from a leader who's adamant that her controversial stance on gender reform and constant independence mission wasn't the downfall. Nothing to see here, people. Yes, we will debate Nicola Sturgeon's legacy. Stay tuned. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome aboard, it's 4pm, it's GB News and you're with me, Patrick Christie. It's a jam-packed hour coming your way. Time is almost up now for Nicola Sturgeon and oh, you just hate to see it, don't you? As she announces that she'll step down as First Minister, surely her controversial stance on gender reform and her hell-bent drive for independence were key reasons for her downfall, but she, naturally, says no. No, it will be tempting to see it as such. This decision is not a reaction to short-term pressures. Of course, there are difficult issues confronting the government just now, but when is that ever not the case? I mean, maybe it was the slightly longer term issues of the education system, the NHS, or 
transport network. I mean, take your pick. Right, what now, though, for independence, her gender reform plans and, crucially, her legacy? Just when you think that people smuggling gangs couldn't find any more dangerous and extreme ways to put lives at risk, well, they do just that. Find out how in our exclusive report and find out the new ways in which people are illegally entering the UK. More areas of the South Coast set to be here and Lancashire Police. They update us on their search for the missing mother, Nicola Bully. But are they really trying to blame the likes of you and me for their lack of results? It would appear so. And they will make their mind up already. Have they made their mind up already? Harry and Meghan are really keeping the suspense in the mystery over whether or not they'll rock up for the coronation. Get your emails coming in, people. Pretty straightforward today. Is it good riddance to Nicola Sturgeon? GBviews at gbnews.uk. Now it's your Patrick, thank you and good afternoon to you. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has thanked Nicola Sturgeon for her service after the First Minister made a surprise announcement today that she's to step down after eight years in power. Speaking at a news conference in Edinburgh, Ms Sturgeon said she was proud to have served as the first female and longest serving First Minister of Scotland. She will remain in the role until her successor is appointed. Ms Sturgeon acknowledged that the move might seem sudden but denied it was due to short-term pressures and said she'd been wrestling with the idea for weeks. Good morning. To those who do feel shocked, disappointed, perhaps even a bit angry with me, please know that while hard, and be in no doubt, this is really hard for me, my decision comes from a place of duty and of love. Tough love, perhaps, but love nevertheless for my party and, above all, for the country. Well, Deputy Leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Megan Gallagher, says the gender reform bill was part of Sturgeon's downfall. It was a deeply unpopular um, policy and, as you say, Nicola Sturgeon failed to take into account the concerns raised by women across the country and she even um, said that those concerns were not valid. So I think when you look um, at the, the position that she put herself in, she backed herself into a corner um, because she ended up defending the indefensible. Now, the Labour leader has today apologised on behalf of his party for the handling of anti-Semitism complaints under his predecessor in the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Sir Keir Starmer also confirmed Mr Corbyn will not stand for the Labour Party at the next general election. The Equality and Human Rights Commission announced it'll end its monitoring of the party two years after finding it responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. Sir Keir Starmer said action, not just an apology, was now needed. To all those who were hurt, to all those who were let down, to all those driven out of our party who no longer felt it was their home, who suffered the most appalling abuse. Today, on behalf of the entire Labour Party, I say sorry. What you've been through can never be undone. Apologies alone cannot make it right. Sir Keir Starmer speaking earlier on today. Now, also in the news today, Lancashire Police say there's still no evidence to indicate a criminal aspect or third-party involvement in the case of Nicola Bully's disappearance in Lancashire. The 45-year-old mother of two has been missing now for 19 days. She was last seen walking her dog, Willow, along the River Wire after dropping her two daughters at a nearby school. Detectives say Nicola was listed as a high-risk missing person due to an undisclosed number of specific vulnerabilities, as they put it. The lead investigator, Rebecca Smith, says the investigation is ongoing. I hope with all my heart that we find Nicola Bully alive more than anything. The likelihood is that Nicola has unfortunately gone in the river. However, I have to stress this because this has been continually misconstrued. I cannot be 100% certain of that at the minute because we are continuing, it's a live investigation and there is always information coming in. Union leaders have said further strikes by teachers will go ahead after disappointing talks with the Education Secretary. 
The General Secretary of the National Education Union, Kevin Courtney, said nothing had persuaded those around the negotiating table to stop strike action, which is planned now for next week. Parents know that their children's education is being disrupted every day and our action has a higher moral purpose, that we are, we are trying to get the government to invest in this generation of children, not just tell us they'll invest in a generation of children in the future, they need to invest in the kids in the schools now in order to help improve their education. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the fight to reduce inflation is far from over, despite the rate decreasing for a third consecutive month. Data from the Office for National Statistics show the consumer price index fell to 10.1% in January. That's down from 10.5% in December. The drop was largely due to the price of fuel and transport slowing down. A British man who died in Ukraine has been named by his family as Jonathan Schenkin from Glasgow. A family tribute on social media said he died as a hero in an act of bravery as a paramedic. He's the eighth British person known to have died in Ukraine since the start of Russia's invasion almost a year ago. The Foreign Office says it's supporting the family and is in contact with local authorities on the ground. Those are your latest news headlines. I'm back in half an hour. Now let's get more from Patrick. Well, Nicola Sturgeon has insisted that her decision to resign was a result of weeks of wrestling with the prospect of stepping down. And, oh, gosh, she, she knows. She knows that a lot of people now will be struggling to cope with this desperately awful news and that they'll be upset and there will be tears left, right and centre. And, it, and it's got nothing to do with recent massive political pressure or several potential impending scandals. This morning, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, announced that she would step down after eight long years in the job. Explaining the timing behind her announcement, she said that it would be difficult to propose policies at the upcoming SNP party conference if she knew that her time in the post would be limited. We are at a critical moment. The blocking of our referendum as the accepted constitutional route to independence is a democratic outrage. But it puts the onus on us to decide how Scottish democracy will be protected and to ensure that the will of the Scottish people prevails. My preference of using the next Westminster election as a de facto referendum is well known. I've never pretended it is perfect. No second best option ever is, nor that there are no alternatives. That is why I've always been clear that the decision must be taken by the SNP collectively, not by me alone. But I know my party well enough to understand that my view as leader would carry enormous, probably decisive weight when our conference meets next month. And I cannot, in good conscience, ask the party to choose an option based on my judgment, whilst not being convinced that I would be there as a leader to see it through. By making my decision clear now, I free the SNP to choose the path it believes to be the right one, without worrying about the perceived implications for my leadership. Yeah, well, just a, a moment's silence now for Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Right. Joining me now is GB News' political editor, Darren McCaffrey. He's all the way at Hollywood. He hot it there for us, didn't he? There we go. Darren, great to see you. OK, so Nicola Sturgeon saying it's not down to short-term pressures and issues and controversies. What is it down to, though, really? Well, I think, you know what, there's a word, Patrick, uh, that people in Scotland use, people like me from Northern Ireland use as well, which is she's scundered. Uh, she's fed up. Uh, she's kind of had enough, if you like. And that is down, I think, in part, it must be to some of those short-term issues, particularly around the trans issue and how she has dealt with that. I don't think there is any doubt, despite her denial, that that has expediated uh, this decision of hers to step down. Uh, but, you know, you look at where she's at. You know, ultimately, she's been in the job for uh, 10 years, essentially. The economy's pretty stagnant. There's clearly not been as much progress in education as she would have liked, given the benchmark she'd set herself. And there is this big, massive, overlooming issue, overlooming issue of the uh, independence. Uh, what is she going or what is the party going to do about this? Uh, 
they are blocked in terms of the UK Supreme Court. It is clear the UK government's not going to give them a means of having this uh, second referendum. And there are divisions in the party about what to do next, to push for this essentially de facto referendum at the next Westminster elections, which a lot of people uh, think is slight nonsense. And so there doesn't seem to be a way through. And in the end, I think, ultimately, when you add all that together, maybe it is not a surprise that she's decided to call it a day, though, of course, she did insist in that press conference it's not going to be the end of her political career, uh, just her time as Scotland's first minister. She should continue to campaign, not least of all for uh, Scottish independence. But in the end, wow, what a massive surprise, Patrick. We don't often get these in politics, actually, where people decide to step away voluntarily and surprise everyone else. We knew, really, it was coming probably to the end of her term in the sense that she might well step down after the next Westminster elections or mm. around the Hollywood elections, but not as soon as this. It has come, really, frankly, as quite a surprise. Yeah. And the big question now, as always with politics, is who the hell takes over? Yes, who, who the hell takes over indeed? And actually, a little bit later on, I'm going to be running through, well, the runners and the riders, as it were. Just quickly, Darren, it was out of the blue. It was a bit of a shock. And I think it seems... Slightly suspicious, doesn't it, really, in some senses? And some people are saying, well, she was very quiet when asked a question in that press conference about the uh, Police Scotland. It's an investigation to allegedly missing money from the SNP funds. She was quite quiet about that, wasn't she? Yeah, I mean, and this involves primarily, it must be said, her husband, who is a really senior figure in the SNP and has been for years, in fact, Effectively, those two have ruled the SNP uh, for, us, say, the best part of a decade. Now, there are police investigations. Again, I, I don't think anyone at the moment is joining dots saying that's the reason why, though it's clear also we don't really know uh, the full story. Uh, as I say, I think she kind of has effectively, Patrick, slightly reached a dead end. Now, let's be clear about this. There are a lot of people here who dislike Nicola Sturgeon. There are a lot of people who really like her as well. And there is no doubt she's been one of the most impressive politicians across these islands over the last decade or so. She's an incredible communicator. Uh, she has, in many ways, shifted the political debates uh, at, here in Hollywood and, indeed, at Westminster. You only have to look at the tweets from lots of our political rivals to recognise that it, she will be a massive, uh, massive loss to the SNP. And I suppose that's the big problem, isn't it, uh, for the SNP, is in the end, where do they turn next? And what does this mean, not just for them, but indeed for the independence movement? Because many would suggest, given what's happened in recent weeks, that it is on a backward slide. And that seems unlikely to change now with Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Well, there we go. Fantastic stuff, Darren. Thank you very much, as ever. Darren McCaffrey, our political editor, and he is at Holyrood for us. Now, my next guest, he said yes at very short notice, ladies and gentlemen. And you never quite know what you're going to get from this particular GB News presenter, this particular proud Scotsman. Is he going to be dour? Is he going to be happy? It's Neil Oliver. He joins me now. Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. And, Neil, your, your, your overwhelming, your overbearing sense when it comes to Nicola Sturgeon stepping down, what's her legacy for you? Well, I have to say, Patrick, it's good to see you, but I have to say, uh, if it's a victory for those of us uh, who knew how much damage Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP were doing to Scotland, then it's a Pyrrhic victory. You know, she's she and her SNP have been there for a very long time now, and you know, the, so much damage has been done. Scotland will take, you know, even if the SNP were to were to disappear from the stage at the same time as First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, it will be generations before the the hurt and the damage inflicted by them can heal. So it's uh, it's something. It'll be good not to hear her voice so often any longer, but the, it'll be, it's a long way back for Scotland from this point. Just run me through what you think the lowlights of Nicola Sturgeon's legacy are for you. You've alluded to damage there. What damage? Well, the whole thing, really. She, I mean, she, I remember she went on and on for a long time about you know wanting to be judged by a record on education. Uh, education, Scot a Scottish education when I was a kid was something that people bragged about. You know, you wanted it to be known the world over that you had been educated in Scottish schools and at Scottish universities. That's long since ceased to be the case under the under the rule of the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon, to such an extent that the SNP have taken Scottish schools off of the international league tables because our performance internationally is so lamentably poor. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, education has gone down the toilet under, under the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, health is on the slide. You know, there are places in the east end of Glasgow where life expectancy for a Scottish man is lower than people in sub-Saharan Africa. Drugs deaths are way up. Crime is up. Uh, she, she gets a, a, her infrastructure efforts, the, the two rusting hulks of ferries that have cost the Scottish taxpayer hundreds of millions of pounds, and there are still no ferries to replace those that, that were required, are required. Uh, the bridge across the River Forth, you know, that, that has to be closed when there's ice on the wires because of the, you know, the, the failures there. It's just a long, long list. And and but m more profound, most profound is the is the ill feeling that's been that's been generated by all the years of uh, incessant calls for one referendum after another. Yeah. That has harmed the society, the community spirit of Scotland. I mean, I wouldn't want to say irreparably, but very, very severely. And that kind of societal hurt will take a long time to fix. Well, it, indeed. I mean, I was floating quite jokingly, really, the idea now that it might be a good time for a snap referendum because given the fact that independence is around 12 points behind in the polls, it might actually put it to bed for a long time. But, of course, I don't really mean that. Neil... You rattled off a huge list there, absolutely, and spot on in terms of some of the negatives you pointed out there. Why is it then that she was so good at winning elections? That's a question that I struggle to answer. It's to my dismay. It's largely it has a great deal to do with the uh, with the with the nature of the uh, the system that was put in place into the devolved Scottish Assembly. Uh, it was it was supposed to be a system that did not give did not gift uh, an overall majority to any one political party, uh, but it was such a hodgepodge, so badly designed by the by the Labour establishment that put it in place, thinking that they and they alone would bestride Scottish politics for an eternity, as they had done for generations previously. I don't think they thought that they had to take too much care over it because they thought that they would continue to run Scotland, and, and you know, obviously we all know what actually happened. Uh, so there was a it, it's an unfortunate quirk of the of the system that the SNP learned to game. Uh, to give them a disproportionate voice. This this incessant use, Nicola Sturgeon was at it again today, talking about the will of the Scottish people. The will of the Scottish people has never been for breaking up, breaking Scotland out of the United Kingdom. You know, it was last meaningfully measured in, uh, you know, in 2014 with the referendum when the resounding result was that Scotland wanted to remain within this incessant way in which the SNP and, and Sturgeon have harped on and on about the will of the voice of the Scottish people when they never have spoken for the entirety of the Scottish people. They speak for the SNP and their supporters who are a minority of Scots. It, you know, I think, to be honest with you, I heard you asking the questions uh, earlier uh, uh, of Darren. I, I would say that she, um, she's gone now, and I think we saw Jacinda Ardern walk off the stage in New Zealand before yeah. she was pushed. I think in for, for different reasons, I think we're going to see politicians around the world uh, in the same predicament. The, the, the last two years, which have seen mishandling of the entire world by overmighty politicians drunk on the power that the pandemic handed them. They caused immeasurable harm economically, to health, just to the spirit of nations. All of that's coming home to roost. And you think, and I they think want... we're going to see yeah. I think we're going to see more and more rats leaving the sinking ships as far okay. as their little legs will carry them. Neil, Neil, thank you very much. And thank you for coming on at short notice as well. And also a wonderful guest appearance from your dog behind you, which is a, a, a top dog, I must say. There you go. Y yes. <laughs> There, 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 that's and another one. Part. All right, I've riled him up. I've riled him up. I'm going to have to leave it, Neil. OK, Neil Oliver there, joining me now. Fantastic. You love it. GB News presenter, proud Scotsman and owner of lovely dogs as well, it would appear. Anyway, joining me now is Conservative councillor for Col Falkirk, Scotland. It's James Bundy. James, great to have you on the show. A bit of a tough follow that, I'm afraid, with Neil Oliver and his dogs. But, um, right, OK, so are you just really, really happy today that Nicola Sturgeon has fallen on a sword. What do you think the real reasons behind her departure are? I'm not that particularly pleased um, because we still have an SNP Green government. Um, we have a government that claims to be stronger for Scotland, but increasingly seems to not understand Scotland. Um, they've just started an attack on the whisky industry with their proposed alcohol advertising ban and this botched deposit return scheme, which they want to push through despite industry saying it's an absolute disaster. 
and they want to build skyscraper uh, wind turbines across Scotland's beautiful landscape. Uh, yeah. a, con- a, a party, a government that claims to love Scotland, promote Scotland, why would you ruin our key well, industries, uh, our landscapes, our beauty? It makes no sense. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you've got the whiskey stuff that you've mentioned there, the landscape as well. You also have what I imagine is roughly 50% of the electorate, which is women, who are not particularly chuffed, a lot of them, with what Nicola Sturgeon decided that she wanted to do. The irony, I think, James, of a female leader, despite what she might say, being brought down by, well, some would argue, a refusal to stand up for women's rights. It's a refusal to stand up for the common good. When governments pass legislation, they have to take in the views and interests of everyone and listen to how, if you legislate in one area, how it impacts another area. And when women were looking at the Gender Reform Bill, they were saying this could lead to men who have committed rape entering uh, female-only spaces uh, with three months of living in the other gender, whatever that means, without any checks. And despite amendments being put up in the Parliament to stop that exact example, Nicola Sturgeon ordered her party to reject that amendment, and then the Labour Party whipped their members to vote for that bill, as well as the Greens, the Liberal well, Democrats, yeah. and Nicola Sturgeon's SNP. Oh. So this is a bigger problem than there's Nicola Sturgeon, okay. and that's why I'm not overwhelmed today, but um, hopefully this is the beginning of the end of the SNP. I, I get what you mean, and I will be talking to the Shadow Minister for Scotland, Sergeant Secretary of State for Scotland, a bit later on, because Labour clearly will be looking at this now as an opportunity. But as you've rightly identified, Labour not particularly sound on any of the issues that you've raised there. And I would just suggest as well that perhaps, for the first time since Thatcher, this is a relatively decent time to be a, a Tory in Scotland now, because you can you can go after the, the natural beauty angle, the fact that people want to stay in the union, you can stand up for women's rights, and, of course, as well, you can promote good Scottish booze. So if you can't win on that ticket, James, then what chance have you got? James Bundy there, Conservative Councillor for Falkirk in Scotland. Good lad, thank you very much. Right, let's get the thoughts of you at home, because joining me now is a GB News viewer. It's Peter Young, and he is a Scot who's now living in the south of England, who's decided to... Uh, Emigrate, I see. Thank you very much, Peter. What's your take, then, as a Scot, on Nicola Sturgeon's resignation? Well, I think it's obviously um, a very good news, but I think that people have been praising her too much because, really, she was good on presentation but not on substance. And I think you know, politicians congratulating her. Congratulating her for what? I mean, the Scottish economy is in a tragic situation. Much lower economic growth than the rest of the UK. We just had figures the other day uh, showing that the number of businesses in Scotland, small, medium and large, were declining and got down to the same level as 2015. That the decline in the Scottish uh, private sector is accelerating. I mean, look at the broader figures. That the, the life expectancy in Scotland is two years below that and the rest of the UK and getting worse, which really indicates that they completely failed to tackle this urban deprivation uh, in the west of Scotland, particularly around the Glasgow area. That explains the, the similar figures to do with increased drug deaths, increased homelessness. So it's really been a tragic performance. And as Neil Oliver was saying, they really have majored on division on whipping up people to do on this independence issue to the exclusion of everything else. And I think in a way Can that... I just, that I'll that come in quickly, people, Peter, on this, if that's all right. I'll just come in quickly on this, because there is the undeniable fact that she has continued to win elections. And despite all of those things that you've rattled off there, which I am absolutely inclined to agree with, don't get me wrong, clearly... She is very popular amongst Scots. What is that, do you think? Do you think she just thrives off the, the, the nationalism, the fact that she isn't a Tory? What is it? Because she has been quite successful, very successful. Well, I think the strategy has been to put the, the, the debate as independence versus um, uh, union, versus staying in the rest of the UK. And the, the parties on the union side are split broadly into three, Liberal, uh, uh, Labour and Conservative. And so if she can focus the debate on that issue of independence, however stupid it is and however uh, appalling the performance of the Scottish Government is, then she can stir up enough people 
perhaps um, uh, who, who better might better educate themselves on the details, but stir, stir them up enough people to, to, to vote for the one independence party, which always beats the three uh, unionist parties. You know, I think in a sense, though, that her luck ran out. She was always trying to create division, and they thought it would be clever to create division over this gender issue. Oh, that was a bridge too far. I mean, bloody no. stupid to put rapists into women prisons. Who on earth could have, could have thought that you was know, ever going you know to what? turn I think, out Peter, well? So you know, I think you know Julie what? I suspect, lost touch. I suspect, Peter, it might be someone who's got drunk on their own punch, for want of a better phrase, because we were calling that early doors and saying, hang on a minute, I'm absolutely convinced that the vast majority of the Scottish public do not support this very niche gender thing. And, uh, you know, it'll go down in history, that image of four or five or six transgender men there at Holyrood, you know in dresses or whatever, cheering at the fact this has gone through. Or the, the SNP and the politicians and the MSP standing up and up, turning around and applauding them. Well, there you go. I tell you what, you can clap Nicola Sturgeon on the way out, can't you? Because that policy, despite what she said, I think Peter did for her, didn't it? Yeah, she's, she was losing a touch. She was drunk on power. That was a bridge too far. I think that whole business of taking the independence issue to the Constitutional Court was also a mistake. So she was just past her sell-by date. She was still trying to stir up division, but the issues she was trying to stir up division about, like the gender thing, were not intelligent ones to run with. So she's uh, she's jumped before she was pushed. And thank God, you know, maybe there's a better chance for the Scottish people and the Scottish economy now. But Scotland needs to concentrate on the basics All right, to do with the economy, the healthcare, education and so forth. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. That enjoyed it thoroughly. Peter Young there is a GB News viewer. Right, you're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. And coming up, we have got an exclusive for you because we're going to shed some light on the extreme avoidance tactics being used by people smuggling gangs to get migrants across the channel in small boats to evade border force. And police say there's still no evidence to indicate a criminal aspect or third-party involvement in that mysterious disappearance of Nicola Bully. They're claiming speculation now, dished out by the public, might even be hampering the police operation. I think that's a risky game for the police to play, that turning the public against them, possibly. Look, I've got your weather now, then. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Bring you the latest news headlines on GB News. And as you've been hearing, Nicola Sturgeon has resigned as First Minister of Scotland after eight years in power. 
Speaking at an unexpected news conference in Edinburgh, Miss Sturgeon said she was proud to have served as the first female and longest serving First Minister of Scotland. Miss Sturgeon acknowledged that the move might seem sudden, but she denied it was due to short term pressures and said she'd been wrestling with the idea for some weeks. To be clear, I'm not expecting violins here, but I am a human being as well as a politician. And the nature and form of modern political discourse means that there is a much greater intensity, dare I say it, brutality to life as a politician than in years gone by. All in all, and actually for a long time without it being apparent, it takes its toll on you and on those around you. In separate news, the Labour leader has apologised on behalf of the party for its handling of anti-Semitism complaints under his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Sir Keir Starmer confirmed Mr Corbyn will not be standing for Labour at the next general election. And the Equality and Human Rights Commission announced it will end its monitoring of the party two years after finding it was responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. Lancashire police say there's still no evidence to indicate a criminal aspect or third-party involvement in Nicola Bully's disappearance. The 45-year-old has been missing for 19 days. She was last seen walking her dog along the River Wire after dropping her two daughters at school. Detectives say Nicola is listed as a high-risk missing person due to a specific number of vulnerabilities. Those are your latest news headlines. I'm back in half an hour. See you then. OK, well, from north of the border to another border now, because it's an exclusive for you, as the UK's maritime rescue services are being warned that they're likely to see migrant boat crossings over a much wider stretch of the southern coastline in the year ahead. GB News can reveal that people smugglers are increasingly launching small boats from much further south along the French coast to try to avoid more robust police patrols around Calais and Dunkirk. Some people are saying, wow, this shows what's going on in Calais and Dunkirk. It's working. They're having to resort to more extreme tactics. Other people are concerned that, frankly, it will mean that different parts of the UK will be used as landing zones for these people. Joining me now is our Home and Security Editor, Mark White. Mark, yes, how concerned should people be in other parts of the UK that they're going to be confronted on their beaches, in their areas, by these small boats? Well, I think it adds to the uncertainty, really, about uh, what is happening in the Channel. Uh, clearly, it can be chaotic enough when you're talking about a small number of routes around Dunkirk and Calais, the shortest distance, really, between France and the UK. But if you then add another 60 miles further down the coast to that, these boats could end up anywhere. And it's likely, without a doubt, to mean that the rescue services over a wider stretch of British coastline may well be called into action in the months ahead. I've been looking back uh, at what this uh, issue is likely to mean for those rescue teams. Racing out from the French coast, a local lifeboat crew responding to reports of a small migrant boat in difficulties. But this incident, also involving a French border patrol vessel, is far away from the usual small boat routes out of Dunkirk and Calais. In fact, we're south of Boulogne, more than 50 miles from those routes. It's one of dozens of rescues the lifeboat based in Berk has attended in recent months. A major uptick in activity as people smugglers attempt to avoid increasing police patrols further north. The numbers have been rising. At the end of 2021, we were involved in many migrant rescues. During 2022, there were significantly more migrants. The further they have to travel by boat, the higher the risks. Travelling from down the coast brings extra dangers. Being in the water for longer brings the danger of hypothermia and even being hit by bigger boats. For the people smugglers, increased police activity around Dunkirk and Calais has made their regular launch points more difficult to operate from. 
French authorities are also busy erecting miles of extra security fencing around those beaches, and that's driving the small boats further south. For years, the criminal gangs have predominantly used the shortest route to the UK, pushing off first from the beaches around Cali, then expanding to include areas near Dunkirk. While occasional boats have been launched further south in the past six months, this route, using beaches near Boulogne, has seen a significant spike in activity. With a beach even further south near Fort Mann, also now regularly being used. And for maritime patrols in UK waters, that means a far greater likelihood that small boats will begin showing up on a much longer stretch of UK coastline in the year ahead. It'll mean rescue teams across a wider area being called out more regularly to boats that have been in the water for many hours. It does put a lot of pressure on the, the resources, you know, these boats are constructed for one purpose, to shift mass numbers of people, but they're designed, you know, constructed very poorly, they're not expected to be standing up to any real sea conditions, the amount of, of people that they are uh, loaded with. So by crossing from further south and spending longer at sea, every second that they're at sea longer than they need to be is just going to increase that risk and that chance of, of, another, of another disaster. There's little doubt, say maritime rescue experts, that those making small boat crossings from further down the French coast will be at far greater risk with predictions that up to 80,000 people could attempt to cross in the year ahead, authorities on both sides of the channel will be stretched to the limit. Mark White, GB News. Well, there we go. The man himself joins me now. Mark White, our Home and Security Editor, is with me in the studio. Mark, really interesting that, that different parts of the UK now might be hit by the migrant crisis. But what is the state of play at the minute in all of this? It's important not to lose sight, is it, of... Frankly, how things have been going already? Yes, um, we've had really two and a half to three months of pretty bad weather uh, with odd breaks in the weather. Every time there's a break in the weather, it's very good and flat calm out there, we get very significant numbers coming. But what we've had is kind of marginal weather conditions over there. It's just about good enough for boats to launch. And that means we've been having about 100, 200 a day. So yesterday, 200 plus landed in Dover. Again, today we're talking about uh, just under 100 that have landed in Kent that have been taken to the processing centre. For the year so far, we're about 2,500 migrants who've come across. Now, that's clearly a long way short of the almost 46,000 mm. who came across last year. But we're still in the very early stages of this year. And if the weather condition... Uh, conditions improve quite significantly in the months ahead, as we expect them to, then we will get very large numbers coming out. I mean, it will be really interesting to see how they manage to go about using these new longer routes, because it does appear as though some of the barricades or defences are working on the French side of the border there. But, yes, it will just have... Time will tell, I suppose, Mark Wente. Thank you very much, Mark White. There, I hope, and security... Editor, who's, yes, brought us that exclusive package there. Fascinating stuff. Maybe reasons to be cheerful, if it does look as though some things are working there, but what does it really mean? Because these people, the people smugglers, are just incredibly ingenious, aren't they, when it comes to managing to get people through? But, yes, the extreme lengths there, that people are going to evade our border security. Stay right here, though, because I've got plenty more to get stuck into between now and 5pm. Our Lancashire police now playing the blame game as they claim false information, accusations, rumours... Our members of the public, supposedly, are distracting them from their work to find missing mum, Nicola Bully, that wax of desperation, if you ask me. I will ask as well, are Harry and Meghan also just, just toying with us as they continue to let the mystery rumble on as to whether or not they will come to the UK for the King's coronation? Apparently, they're afraid of the reaction. Well, so they should be. Back in a tick. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. 
People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Well, the mystery over Nicola Bully's disappearance continues to grow. Lancashire police say that detectives have been distracted by false information, accusations and rumours. Now, I... Well, from where I'm sitting, anyway, it did seem like a weird tactic from the police, really, almost like pitting the public against them. Bizarre, really, especially considering that the family of Nicola Bully are desperate to try to gather as much information as they possibly can. But updating the public on the search, police said that top talent had been out searching for the mother of two, and amateur sleuths and social media video makers were derailing the investigation. Sophie Reaper is GB News's North West of England reporter. You've been following this story. I believe you're at that press conference as well, weren't you? And you join us now from Lancashire. Sophie, thank you very, very much. I mean, the mystery continues to grow around this. The police saying that you know, it was treated with high priority, there were specific vulnerabilities. I mean, it's all... Every time they talk, it all gets a bit weirder. Absolutely, and I, I was here this morning for that press conference with Lancashire Police. And just before the press conference began, members of the media were given one of these, a little handover, which is full of various facts and figures. But on the back, there's a timeline from that morning, Friday the 27th of January, the morning that Nicola Bully first disappeared. Now, interestingly, just under an hour and a half after Nicola's phone was found, on the bench by the river in St Michael's on Wire. We get this, 11.01 hours, Nicola was reported to us as a missing person and immediately graded as high risk. Now, police say the reason she was immediately graded is, as high risk is because of specific vulnerabilities. Now, they say they can't elaborate on what those vulnerabilities exactly are. They say they're personal to the family. But what they did tell us was that they've known about these vulnerabilities since the very beginning and that this kind of thing is very common in a missing persons investigation. Now, also in this handover, I'm not sure you'll be able to read those, but there's some very key uh, facts and figures in there. So, for example, uh, they've spoken to 300 people already as part of this investigation. They've had 50 pieces of dash cam footage submitted as they try to jigsaw together exactly what might have happened on that morning. And they've had over 50... 1,500 pieces of information sent in by members of the public. Now, this morning, uh, Detective Superintendent Becky Smith uh, made sure that we were all aware exactly how grateful she is to members of the public for their assistance so far in this case. But what she also assured us was that she, she needs people to stop speculating around this case. She says that they've been inundated with uh, 
false information, accusations and rumours. And she said all of this is not helping with their investigation to try and find Nicola Bully. Thank you very, very much. I mean, it was really informative, actually, what you've just done there. And fascinating to see that bug that was handed out, the timeline of it. And I just can't help but feel this question of what are these specific vulnerabilities. It's, it's going to keep raising its head. Look, thank you very, very much. Sophie Reaper there, who's GB News' northwest of England reporter. Yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly mysterious, of course, it is. The police not veering from their idea that they believe that there was no third party involvement or it would appear anyway anything to indicate anything criminal has taken place in the Nicola Bully case. They were, as we all know, searching that river and the stretch of river and a wider stretch of river for what has been now 19 days, coming up to 20 days, hasn't it? But the fact that she was reported missing and treated with the highest priority so early on there, and now they've said specific vulnerabilities, what does that all really mean? We'll have to wait and see, won't we? But uh, back to our top story now. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has confirmed that she'll be stepping down after eight long years in the job. She made the announcement at a press conference in Edinburgh this morning and said that she'd been wrestling with the question of whether or not to resign for weeks. Well, following the announcement, Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland, Ian Murray MP, joins me now, I'm very pleased to say. Thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. This is a, a, a an open goal now, is it not, for Labour to run head first into. Labour might do some damage in Scotland, will they? How are you going to do it? Uh, well, I think firstly we should uh, give a gratitude to Nicola Sturgeon for the service that she's provided. We disagreed on most things, but uh, she's been a, a stalwart of Scottish politics and has led the debate through some of uh, Scotland's most difficult times. But, you know, Anas Sarwar is the Scottish Labour Party leader. He's popular. He's talked today about new ideas and a new passion. He's the insurgent in Scottish uh, politics. He's taken to the Scottish Labour Party to the low 30% uh, in the polls. Uh, and it's now time for, I think, the reset button to be hit on Scottish politics with Nicola Sturgeon's departure and for us to get back to the priorities of ordinary Scots, which is the cost of living crisis, the NHS, education and the like, very similar priorities than they are to the rest of the UK. And that has been putting forward scrutiny of the government's dreadful record on these issues uh, for the last two years. And he's coming up with his own ideas and positive policy platform. We're excited about taking that to the Scottish people and today gives us an opportunity to use that as a platform. Absolutely. But despite what Nicola Sturgeon has to say, the fact is that the straw that broke the camel's back is because she couldn't really fully admit that an individual who was a male rapist who was sent to a women's prison was in fact a man. And if Labour wants to make inroads in there, you are going to have to sort that out. Is the individual who raped women and was put in a women's prison a man or a woman? Well, I think it's quite clearly it was a, a man who was trying to portray uh, himself as a woman and using uh, the law and manipulating the law uh, to do so. But I think the big question here, and I think Nicola Sturgeon touched on this in her press conference, if you listen to it carefully, was twofold. One was she had lost control of her party. We've seen that here with uh, Ian Blackford uh, being taken out as the Westminster uh, leader for the SNP and replaced by Stephen Flynn, who was not Nicola Sturgeon's uh, choice for the role. And we've seen that she's lost control of the de facto referendum that she wanted to turn the next general uh, election into. So when you put all that together, she's lost control of the party, she's lost control of the only issue she went into politics to do to deal with, independence, and her record in government is pretty appalling. In fact, I think she even struggled herself today to say what her legacy was as, after eight years mm. as First Minister. She, to be fair, she did, actually, and she was clinging to the idea of the baby boxes and all of this stuff, which, I've mean, look, it's a nice touch, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, after that length of time in office, I suspect that it would have been or should have been a, a, a stronger legacy. I'm just going to ask you one more on this, and then I will, I will move on to other topics when it comes to what's going on north of the border. But, you know, Labour did help wave through the thing that has led to Nicola Sturgeon's demise, this Gender Recognition Act. I mean, do you regret that now? Because you will forever be linked with what is an absolute disaster. Well, Labour didn't wave it through. We, as an opposition party, have to deal with what's in front of us, not the way we would uh, do it ourselves. We got the Equality Act on the face of the bill, which uh, the Equality Act does allow for the discrimination against uh, trans people as exemptions to the Equality Act to protect single-sex spaces. We got that as an amendment on the face of the bill. We got protections for 16 uh, and 17-year-olds on the face of the bill, and we got additional uh, guidelines and protections on the face of the bill in order to uh, protect women and to protect trans people. So it wasn't an ideal piece of legislation. It wasn't dealt. With 
with properly. The Scottish Government didn't bring uh, people together, uh, and we backed our amendments to get that uh, to get the amendments on the face of the bill. That was the right uh, thing to do to get those amendments on a bad piece of legislation. Uh, and now the section 35, which we're not opposing, is down on the table to stop the piece of legislation because of cross-border issues. I think that was the uh, the right thing to do, and uh, and Assar has been pretty clear on that. And you mentioned Nicola Sturgeon's legacy, really, and what she leaves behind. 68% more people going to private health care and to try to swerve the NHS up there in Scotland. The attainment gap, which she was quite squiffy on when she was doing her legacy element of her speech there, actually isn't particularly great. The drug death stuff gets wheeled out left, right and centre, doesn't it? You don't need me to tell you that. Even potholes, apparently. Potholes, supposedly, are at one of the worst levels ever in Scotland. Who knew? But there we go. And independence, the cause for independence, now 12 points behind in the polls. This is a good opportunity for Labour. If Labour gets Scotland right, it could actually give them the keys to Downing Street, couldn't it? Well, and that's the message to Scottish voters. They are desperate for a UK Labour government. We are desperate to prove that a UK Labour gov government can transform the whole of the UK and really change Scotland uh, for the better. And the list of things that you've just read off there is the legacy of 15 years of SNP government uh, in Scotland. The reason there's potholes all over Scotland is because they've absolutely decimated local authority funding who've no funds whatsoever to run basic services, let alone fill potholes in in the street. And that's the legacy that this First Minister leaves. It's up for us now in an Assar and Keir Starmer to put forward that positive, pragmatic uh, and progressive policy platform that everyone wants to see, that can show that the UK Labour government can transform Scotland and be a UK Labour government for the benefit of the whole of the UK, uh, and to show that the, Scottish, the priorities of the Scottish people are our priorities and not to get dividing Scotland on the issue of the Constitution. We need to bring people together and do what's in the very best interests of the whole of Scotland, and that's what Anas Sarr was determined to deliver. It could be argued, given the polling data when it comes to independence at the minute, 12% behind on, in the polls, that now might be a good time to have a snap independence referendum because you would put it to bed once and for all, wouldn't you? Would you be in favour of that? I just think there's huge priorities out there that are nothing to do with the Constitution. I'm sure your viewers and anybody who's interacting with Scottish politics at the moment would like us to talk about how people are going to pay their heating bills, how we're going to get through this interest rate crisis, the inflation crisis, the jobs crisis we all have in this country and the crisis in our uh, public services. The last thing we need to do is to go into six months right. of more division, more economic wrangling, more wrangling over the Constitution uh, when it's not a priority for Scots and there's bigger issues that politicians yeah. need to be concentrating on. And that's why I think today should be used as a reset button for the whole of Scottish politics to get okay. on with the priorities of the Scottish people. Ian, thank you very much. Enjoyed that. Ian Murray there, MP, who is the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland. Interesting to get Labour's take on this. Labour are in a fantastic position in Scotland, quite possibly. Yeah, they did get some amendments added to that Gender Recognition Act, which is an absolute shocker, let's be honest. So that just kind of get them off the hook a little, a little bit with that. And, yeah, frankly, if they do well in Scotland, which they may well end up doing now, then it could give them the keys to Downing Street. He did say that there are bigger issues for the people of Scotland. Forgive me for being sceptical when I say that I think there are bigger issues at play here for Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Very, very, very quiet was old Nicola there when it comes to uh, Police Scotland investigating uh, missing £600,000 from SNP funds. I can't help but wonder whether or not there's something coming down the road there and she wanted out. But lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on Sturgeon stepping down. Keith from Lincoln just says, at last, our great nation can rejoice together in the news that the main architect attempting to split the union will be stepping down. Janine, though, says the end of an era. This is a big moment, but now is not the time for political turmoil. She was a huge figure and influence, and her policies during COVID, no doubt, saved so many lives. It's an interesting view on that one, really, isn't it? Nicola Sturgeon's speech for me was an absolute lesson in how to desperately try to control the narrative. They will have been saying there when they were writing that speech, what do we not want to come out of this? We do not want it to seem like you are bowing under the weight of short-term polling data, which is showing that the cause for independence is taking an absolute kicking and that your personal popularity is taking a kicking and you've got it really badly wrong when it comes to the gender stuff. So what did she come out and go? Well, it's got nothing to do with short-termism. I've weathered all of this stuff before. It's got nothing to do with the gender acts. Oh, yes, and, and me personally, well, I, I had plenty more in the tank. Yeah, all right, whatever. Anyway, there we go. It's the end of Nicola Sturgeon. For the meantime, well, speculation continues, though, to swirl around the attendance of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at King Charles's coronation in May. Both Harry and Meghan have been invited to attend the ceremony, so the ball is very much in their court, but the prince 
is reportedly seeking a meeting with his father and brother before he makes any decision to leave Montecito. Well, I'll tell you what, we can make that decision for you, I think, Harry. But with me now is Nicholas Owen, Royal Correspondent. Nicholas, thank you. Great to have you on the show. Well, who does Harry think he is? I need a meeting with my father and brother before I can come to your coronation. What's going on? <laughs> Well, it, it's balmy, isn't it? I, I, I agree with you. Let, let's just sort of step back a bit and consider uh, what is the best way forward for everybody concerned. And to me, it would be this. Of course, they get an invitation. They must be seen to be invited. And let's make as much as we can of the fact that they are welcome to come to this uh, coronation. Uh, and we'd love, to, we'd love to see them in rather heavy quotes, I think, Patrick, there. And then the response from them should be, thank you very much, but we do not want to distract we do mm. not want to draw attention away from what is a most historic and important event in all of our lives and certainly in the lives of the royal family. So we will be at home relaxing and we will be watching very carefully and following it with great, uh, uh, great attention. But the, mm. that's, that's the way to do it. Get the invitation in and a polite decline. And that's yeah. certainly the most sensible but, step, is it not? Well, well I, I agree with you. I think everyone would agree with you pretty much on that. But the reality is that the way that they've gone about behaving in recent months or years, really, would indicate that they do want to steal the limelight, that they do want to cause as much controversy as possible. So is there not every chance that right at the last minute we're going to end up seeing a private jet landing, touching down somewhere, and Harry and Meghan getting off of it? <laughs> You're talking about sort of gate-crashing a coronation. Gate-crashing, yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of it, I must yeah. say. As a journalist, it sounds fascinating, doesn't it? <laughs> but, but you know, let's, let's get real about this. Uh, I, I do think that Meghan and Harry, if they think about it very, very carefully, do they really want to just give themselves ammunition for yet another round of Netflix series and books and goodness knows what? Are they really interested or are they really interested in patching things up, in getting back together, uh, putting all these family squabbles behind them? That, that's really the question that has to be answered, isn't it? And I would, I, I can't say, it's, I was trying to calculate, it's not very far away, is it? It's only a couple and a half months away, 10 weeks, 11 week something like yeah. that doesn't seem like enough time to me to get this thing no. sorted in time no, no, much and, better to sit, back. And the sit back, back sit back yeah, the backlash, I think, as well. If they're worried about there being some public backlash, well, they've got a right to be worried because they're not particularly popular at the minute. Nicholas, thank you very much. Short and sweet, but it was gold nonetheless. Nicholas Owen, their royal correspondent, <laughs> giving you the update on whether or not Harry and Meghan are going to come to the coronation. What does Harry want? He wants his family to sit back as they trash the royal family, they trash Britain, they call us all essentially frothing little racists, and then they do their Netflix documentary. By the way, I would recommend watching that, namely because I'm in it. I don't like to go on about it, but I am in it. Anyway... Coming up before 6pm, the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon. Burnout, like she says, or a controversial stance on gender reform and a campaign for independence. And are the police playing the blame game, blaming you when it comes to their lack of, well, results when it comes to the Nicola Bully case? I'll be back in a tick, people. Don't move. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. Now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubri, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Welcome back, everybody. It's five o'clock. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News, and what a time to be alive, everybody. Nicola Sturgeon has resigned, but despite pressures on her stance on gender reform and independence, she is adamant, adamant, I tell you, that that has got nothing to do with her downfall. No, it will be tempting to see it as such. This decision is not a reaction to short-term pressures. Of course, there are difficult issues confronting the government just now, but when is that ever not the case? Just a brief moment of silence there for Nicola Sturgeon. Right. The Sturgeon dynasty has collapsed. Queen Nick has abdicated. Brave hearts will cry freedom no more. But despite what she says, critics claim the female leader has been brought down, ironically, by a failure to protect women's rights. What now for independence? What's her legacy? And I will reveal in other news, the shocking new lengths that channel migrants are going to to evade British border force. Find out where the new launch and landing sites are as different parts of the South Coast brace themselves, frankly, for another potentially record year of arrivals. And where is Nicola Bully? Police seem to be blaming the public now for their lack of results in the mysterious case of the missing mum in Lancashire. I'll be shining the spotlight of scrutiny firmly on the cops. How can someone just disappear off the face of the earth? And you will not believe, you will not believe what Harry and Meghan have said about coming to King Charles's coronation. Get your emails coming in, people. Pretty straightforward today, isn't it? Is it good riddance to Nicola Sturgeon? GB News at gbnews.uk. But right now, it's your headlines. Patrick, thanks very much indeed. And the top stories on GB News this afternoon, as you've been hearing, Rishi Sunak has thanked Nick Nicola Sturgeon for her service after the First Minister made a surprise announcement she was to step down after eight years in power. Ms Sturgeon said she was proud to have been the first female and longest-serving First Minister of Scotland. She'll remain in the role until her successor is appointed. Ms Sturgeon acknowledged that the move might seem sudden but denied it was due to short-term pressures and said she'd been wrestling with it for some weeks. To those who do feel shocked, disappointed perhaps even a bit angry with me, please know that while hard, and being no doubt, this is really hard for me, my decision comes from a place of duty and of love. Tough love, perhaps, but love nevertheless for my party and above all for the country. Well, the deputy leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Megan Gallagher, says the gender reform bill was part of Sturgeon's downfall. It was a deeply unpopular um, policy and, as you say, Nicola Sturgeon failed to take into account the concerns raised by women across the country and she even um, said that those concerns were not valid. So I think when you look um, at the, the position that she put herself in, she backed herself into a corner um, because she ended up defending the indefensible. Now, the Labour leader has today apologised on behalf of his party for its handling of anti-Semitism complaints under his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Sir Keir Starmer also confirmed Mr Corbyn will not be standing for Labour at the next general election. And the Equality and Human Rights Commission announced it'll end its monitoring of the party two years after finding it responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. Sakia Starmer said action, not just an apology, was needed. To all those who were hurt, to all those who were let down, to all those driven out of our party who no longer felt it was their home, who suffered the most appalling abuse. Today, on behalf of the entire Labour Party, I say sorry. What you've been through can never be undone. Apologies alone cannot make it right. 
Now, in other news today, Lancashire police say there's still no evidence to indicate any criminal aspect or third-party involvement in the disappearance of Nicola Bully. The 45-year-old mother of two has been missing for 19 days now. She was last seen walking her dog along the River Wire after dropping her two daughters at school. Detectives say Nicola was listed as a high-risk missing person due to an undisclosed number of specific vulnerabilities. The lead investigator, Rebecca Smith, says the investigation is ongoing. I hope with all my heart that we find Nicola Bully alive more than anything. The likelihood is that Nicola has unfortunately gone in the river. However, I have to stress this because this has been continually misconstrued. I cannot be 100% certain of that at the minute because we are continuing. It's a live investigation and there is always information coming in. Union leaders have said further strikes by teachers will go ahead after disappointing talks with the Education Secretary. The General Secretary of the National Education Union, Kevin Courtney, said nothing had persuaded those around the negotiating table to stop strike action, which is now planned for next week. Parents know that their children's education is being disrupted every day and our action has a higher moral purpose, that we are, we are trying to get the government to invest in this generation of children, not just tell us they'll invest in a generation of children in the future, they need to invest in the kids in the schools now in order to help improve their education. International news and six reportedly Russian balloons have been spotted across Ukraine's capital. Kyiv's military says most of them have been shot down by their air defence systems. The air vessels were reportedly carrying corner reflectors and reconnaissance equipment. That's after the Ukrainian Air Force said Russia could be using balloons in a new drive to preserve its stocks of reconnaissance drones. Russia hasn't commented on the incident. But a British man who died in Ukraine has now been named as his family as Jonathan Shenkin from Glasgow. A family tribute on social media said he died as a hero in an act of bravery as a paramedic. He's the eighth British person known to have died in Ukraine since the start of Russia's invasion this time last year. The Foreign Office says it's supporting the family and is in contact with local authorities on the ground. That's your latest news. I'm back in half an hour. More now from Patrick. Well, this afternoon, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has declined to say whether Nicola Sturgeon's resignation was a blow for Scottish independence. I mean, it is as he insisted voters want to see the Scottish Government and Westminster working constructively together on the priorities that really matter to people. Scotland's First Minister announced that she'll step down after eight long years in post. She claimed she'd been wrestling with the question of whether or not to resign for weeks. This is, of course, in contrast to suggestions that she quit because of a backlash from a former, sorry, from a controversial gender reform bill, I should say, and also as well, potentially, a couple of bits and bobs that are coming down the road in relation to the SNP's finances, which will make for gripping viewing in a matter of months' time. Joining me now is GB News's political editor, Darren McCaffrey. He's at Holyrood for us. Darren, thank you very much. Yes, so oh, Rishi Sunak refusing to say that he's damaged Scottish independence, probably because he doesn't want to rile up the nationalists even more. Yeah, well, there is any doubt, as you've noted, Patrick, that this is a blow, I think, to the independence movement. There is little doubt that Nicola Sturgeon has been not just its key advocate, but probably its best advocate in many ways over the last decade or so. She is an incredible communicator. I would suggest the best political communicator uh, on uh, this island or on these islands, uh, certainly uh, of the last 10 years or so. And clearly her disappearance as First Minister of Scotland will be a blow to the independence movement. Now, she insists she's not going to leave the political stage entirely. She is going to continue to fight for the cause that she's fought for for the last uh, 40 years. Uh, but the big question is, she's going to leave behind a big pair of shoes. Who is going to fill them? Now, why is she left? She says 
she does so with a heavy heart because she knows going forward she's just not going to have the kind of same drive if you like to do the job with the same energy that she thinks is necessary and I think there is an element of truth to that I think she is probably tired and a bit fed up she's kind of probably seen it all and done it all and she probably does want to move on uh, you know being at the top of the physical game for a decade is a long time and it I'm sure it does sap the energy out of you, but also be in no doubt that politically she's in a very tricky situation at the moment. The health service here in Scotland, like the rest of the UK, is not in a terribly good state. She'd set standards in terms of education attainment that she frankly hasn't uh, reached. And there is that big question about precisely what will the SNP do when it comes to the independence argument? Where do they turn next? At the moment, they're boxed in, effectively by the UK Supreme Court, saying that they cannot legally have a second referendum here and the UK Parliament saying we're not going to grant you one and the SNP frankly don't have an easy answer yeah. to that. There have been suggestions that she wanted to use the next Westminster election as a de facto referendum. There are many within the SNP who don't want that. So she is going to leave a big gaping hole in Scottish politics, there's no doubt about that. And that raises big questions for the SNP and big questions about where the independence movement here in Scotland turns next. Yeah, Darren, look, call me a cynic, call me a cynic, but I can't help but feel as though the fact that there is a, a Police Scotland investigation into a missing £600,000 from SNP funds might have some kind of bearing on a decision. Yeah, you know what, in the end, Patrick, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but you're entirely right in saying there is this investigation. It primarily involves uh, her, her husband, who is, by the way, a senior member uh, of the SNP and has been effectively ruling this party along with Nicola Sturgeon uh, for the best part of a decade. At the same time, you add into the fact, have recent events, i.e., rise around the gender recognition uh, bill uh, and the arguments around all of that have they had an impact i think they have nicola sturgeon insisted some of those short-term things did not have an impact this is something she's been thinking about for a while i think it'd be wrong to suggest that it didn't have any impact at all so this is a whole myriad of reasons uh, why she's decided to make this decision today but wow was it a shock patrick and we don't often get resignation shocks uh, in politics, but today really was a real surprise. And again, I come back, many people like Nicola Sturgeon, a lot of people do not like her, but it is a sign of her political gravity uh, and her gravitas uh, that she has had a whole series of tweets and messages and interviews today from politicians from across the board who, while politically disagreeing with her, have at least recognised the impact that she's had on politics, not just here in Scotland, but across the whole of the UK. OK, Darren, thank you very much. Darren McCaffrey there, our political editor. I've been asking you at home, ladies and gentlemen, whether or not you think it's good riddance to Nicola Sturgeon. GB views at gbnews.uk. Peter thinks so. She was a divisive figure in Scottish politics, so I'm glad she's gone. She never accepted the once-in-a-lifetime independence vote. Yeah, OK, fair enough. Uh, the bigger picture now is that Sturgeon... Uh, has been knocked off her perch. Yes, indeed, that's from Ian. Good stuff. Quite a lot of Scots getting in touch, actually. Great to know that we're quite big in Scotland. Unlike Nicola Sturgeon anymore these days. Oh, you hate to see it, don't you? Uh, support for independence is now below the 45% mark recorded. So, yes, would be 44%, which is done for her, I think, as well, partly. And interesting polling this as well, which is... Uh, a poll over the weekend found that 42% want the SNP leader, wanted the SNP leader, to stand down immediately. Those figures are pretty stark. Then you answer that as well, the Alex Salmon case as well. Mysterious incidents there, wasn't you? Oh, I couldn't recall all of the conversations I had with Alex Salmon. I couldn't recall it. Then someone goes, hang on a minute, Nicola, did your husband give 100 grand to the, the party? Well, I don't know about my husband's finances. He's... Top of the party there. She lives with him. No idea about 100 grand. I mean, I dare say I would have a thing or two to say if my missus decided to part with £100,000 and not let me know about it. So that is fascinating. And as well, there is, of course, the ongoing investigation into the missing, quotes unquote, missing £600,000 from SNP funds. Possibly time to go, Nicola, I think. Possibly time to go. Joining me now is Michael Simmons, a data journalist at The Spectator. Thank you very much. Great to have you back on the show. Look, what we haven't spoken about yet in the show is who are the runners and riders to fill in for Queen Nick? Who's going to take over, do you think? So, um, Ladbrokes were quick out of the kind of shots with um, some odds this morning. And their favourite is Angus Robertson. 
Um, and he was once the Westminster leader of the SNP, but he, he lost his seat in the general election uh, to Douglas Ross. Uh, and he found his way back to Holyrood. Um, and he's now very much the sort of establishment character. He's probably who the kind of Sturgeonites will want to want to put in place um, as their leader. Um, he's had battles with Joanna Cherry, though, in the past over his selection for his current seat. So he's, although he's the kind of out and out favourite, he'd mm. be a controversial choice. Any noises about Hamza Youssef? Yeah, so Hamza Youssef is currently the kind of embattled um, health secretary, uh, and he is in there. He's about sort of fifth in the in the running um, in the odds. Um, but again, Hamza Youssef is quite a controversial character. He's had trouble in the past. He was found to be driving without insurance when he was the transport minister. Um, and there has been, uh, you can read in The Spectator tomorrow, some talk about um, how he's sort of perceived by, by his staff. Um, so again, a possible runner and rider, uh, but again, quite a controversial choice. Yes, and there was, of course, an incident at a nursery school that we, we, won't, we won't mention. Um, OK, yeah. all right, so when it comes to the uh, Scottish independent side of it, for example, Michael, you as a data journalist, you look at the polls, you crunch the numbers. Is this a win for people who want to keep the union together? Just Sturgeon, frankly, just packed it in and with it, poof, there goes Scottish independence. Um, I, I'm not going to say, you know, there goes Scottish independence, but it is certainly a blow to the to the sort of independence movement. Mm. Um, Sturgeon had a, a huge sort of personal cult following and personal um, kind of popularity. I think even if you disagree with her, she, she was a great kind of effective communicator. So a lot of that power and sort of that voter base who maybe aren't diehard independent supporters, but were just okay. fans of Nicola Sturgeon, will kind of go away. And one thing that really, uh, you know, illustrates this, there was a poll at the weekend about who P S P members would want to take over. Mm. Um, and I think that the highest person was Kate Forbes, but she only had about 7% of the poll. And Don't Know had 69%. So that just shows you how mm. much of a gap there was between Nicola Sturgeon and the other potential candidates. Yeah, potentially trying to secure her legacy. If the SNP does crumble, it's a little bit like what I would call the Sir Alex Ferguson effect, OK? You leave and then you realise there's a vacuum beneath you. Nobody does well for quite a while and your own reputation is even further enhanced than it was to begin with. Just in terms of, I suppose, the vital question, Nicola Sturgeon desperately trying to control the narrative on her departure that it was nothing to do with these short-term issues. You might think it was, everyone might think it was, but I can guarantee you it was nothing to do with the fact that I've made a right horlicks of things recently. Has she left Scotland in a worse place than when she found it, when you look at things like the NHS, education, transport, etc.? Well, this is the thing with Sturgeon, is that um, her legacy really is, I would say, talk and not action. In that she's, she's done this communication, she gets sort of certain you know, liberal commentators down in England are big fans of her. But when you look at the actual, you know, the data and the measurable things which the Scottish government don't want attention drawn to, like the NHS, like education, things are either, you know, no better or, or worse than um, when she came to office. I think the most stark example of this is the drug deaths. Um, those have risen for sort of seven of the eight years that she's been in power, and they now stand, you know, higher than anywhere else in the UK, higher than anywhere else in Europe. Um, and, you know, she had eight years where this was a known problem and it could have been tackled, but instead, you know, rehab facilities were cut. And as a result, those numbers have just climbed. So I think the numbers kind of speak for themselves that she may have, you know, changed the image of the SNP, brought independence that little bit closer, but the actual, you know, improvements to the country just don't seem to be there. Michael, you know your stuff. Thank you very, very much. That is Michael Simmons there, a data journalist at The Spectator. Yeah. Fascinating, that wasn't it? Which does actually, I think, answer quite a few questions. The main one for me, you know, has Nicola Sturgeon left Scotland worse than when she found it? And, well, the data would indicate that, yes, she actually has. So there we go. As we've been discussing, though, some are saying that the row over Sturgeon's planned transgender reforms contributed most to her downfall, i.e. calling a male rapist who was put into a women's prison a woman, which I think most of us can agree that just putting a wig on and wearing some leggings doesn't make you a woman. There we go. She had championed a bill which allowed trans people to change their legal gender without a me medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria, a move that was blocked by the Westminster government. Sturgeon denied, there we go, denied that it played... No, it didn't play any role in my decision to step down. So oh, that issue wasn't the final straw. Look, I'm, I'm long enough in the tooth. I've, I've been in politics, as all of you know, for a long, long time. I'm not going to stand here and insult your intelligence and say that I live 
in a world uh, that is divorced from the realities of what is going on around me. Um, but it's not the case that this decision is because of short-term issues. I've faced more short-term issues from time to time over my years in politics than I, I care to remember. Um, and if it was just that, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. I will always be a voice for inclusion, for quality, equality, for human rights uh, and dignity. Um, I have been am and will always be a feminist. I will fight for women's rights and I will stand up against threats to women's rights uh, every uh, day that I have breath in my body. OK. Joining me now is co-founder of the LGB Alliance, is Bev Jackson. Bev, thank you very much. Now, Nicola Sturgeon Hi. might be saying... Hi, nice to see you again, Patrick. Yes, yeah, lovely to see you again. Thank you very much for coming back on. Um, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon is saying that the fact that she's managed to alienate nearly 2.8 million women in Scotland has got absolutely nothing to do with her departure. Do you agree with her? Well, no, I don't think so. I think there's a, there's a bit of a porky there. She's quite good at that. As we heard uh, Laura uh, in an interview with Laura Koonsberg just a few weeks ago when she said she was very, very far away from, from being... Uh, um, from, from feeling that she, she wanted to step down. So I think it's quite clear what's happened. And everybody saw the moment at which she was asked whether this uh, um, rapist, this uh, now call it, calling um, himself Bryson, whether whether he was a, a man or a woman. And, and she broke into a kind of hysterical little giggle and then invented the third gender rapist. And uh, she couldn't answer it. And at that point, um, it became clear to everybody. I think the whole House of Cards came, came tumbling down, or to use a different metaphor, I think everybody could see the Emperor has no clothes. You can't, you can't de define yourself. If you suddenly tell me that you, that you're a woman, you you, you know it, it's it's absurd that I should have to believe that, and that the whole of of, of our laws should have to be rearranged but, to accommodate that. It simply makes no sense. And I think the whole society saw that at that time. Yeah, but Bev, in in a way, in a quite morbid way, potentially it's a good thing that this pantomime has played out in the way it has because I think that what happened here was Sturgeon was getting drunk on her own power and this big progressive agenda, they all felt untouchable. They thought, well, as long as I'm sticking up for some kind of quotes unquote marginalised community, I am doing a good thing. And then the public just went, actually, you're not. I think this is nuts, for want of a better phrase. And, uh, and, and you're out. And so now this might just halt this kind of woke nuttery in its tracks, no? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, th I think it's really true that what you said that what, what's happened is uh, um, in many other countries, um, self-ID has been introduced kind of under the radar. People thought, just as you said, they're doing something progressive and nice for a small group of people. They didn't really understand the consequences. And now now this is played out in public and people uh, there has been a proper debate. People say, whoa, it is not true what Nicola Sturgeon mm. said, that it doesn't affect women's rights. It's, it's not true that the people who oppose it are all bigots and, 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 and transphobes and even racist, she said at some point. Mm -hmm. it, it, it isn't also isn't true that this, what, another porky, I'm afraid, that this was a very widely consulted bill. You know, all the people, all these groups that she said, they all agreed with me. These groups are actually, if you look at it, uh, uh, interesting article in, by Susan Dalgetty. You can see these these groups are all funded by the Scottish government. There's a kind oh. of circular um, policy making going on. Yeah. We give you some money, and then you scratch, you uh, we scratch your back, you you scratch ours. And this isn't that kind of is that's not democracy, isn't it? A kind of corruption. Well, well, well. I mean, we will have to let people make their own minds up about that, Bev, won't we? But, Bev, thank you very, very much. Always a pleasure, Bev, and I'll speak to you again very soon, no doubt. Bev Jackson there, who's the co-founder of you. LGB Alliance, of course, on an unrelated note to what Bev was saying there. It's interesting, Police Scotland investigation into a missing £600,000 from SNP funds. Anyway, right, OK, so you're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News, and you almost won't believe our exclusive, by the way, which reveals the extreme new measures that people smugglers are taking to avoid our border patrols in France and here in the UK. It means that different parts of the UK, frankly, are going to have more migrant landings on it, find out whether or not it's coming to a place near you. And our Lancashire police now playing the blame game as they claim false information, accusations, rumours. Basically, the public, they're blaming the public, supposedly, for their lack of ability, their inability to help find missing mum Nicola Bully. I'll be back in a tick, people.
first and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion, and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Okay, welcome back and exclusive for you now because the UK's Maritime Rescue Service are being warned that they're likely to see migrant boat crossings over a much wider stretch of the southern coastline in the year ahead. GB News can reveal that people smugglers are increasingly launching small boats from different locations along the French coast, which means they will be evading the patrols and potentially landing at different locations in the UK. Our Home and Security Editor Mark White has this exclusive report for us. Racing out from the French coast, a local lifeboat crew responding to reports of a small migrant boat in difficulties. But this incident, also involving a French border patrol vessel, is far away from the usual small boat routes out of Dunkirk and Calais. In fact, we're south of Boulogne, more than 50 miles from those routes. It's one of dozens of rescues the lifeboat based in Berk has attended in recent months. A major uptick in activity as people smugglers attempt to avoid increasing police patrols further north. The numbers have been rising. At the end of 2021, we were involved in many migrant rescues. During 2022, there were significantly more migrants. The further they have to travel by boat, the higher the risks. Travelling from down the coast brings extra dangers. Being in the water for longer brings the danger of hypothermia and even being hit by bigger boats. For the people smugglers, increased police activity around Dunkirk and Calais has made their regular launch points more difficult to operate from. 
French authorities are also busy erecting miles of extra security fencing around those beaches, and that's driving the small boats further south. For years, the criminal gangs have predominantly used the shortest route to the UK, pushing off first from the beaches around Calais, then expanding to include areas near Dunkirk. While occasional boats have been launched further south in the past six months, this route, using beaches near Boulogne, has seen a significant spike in activity. With a beach even further south near Fort Mann, also now regularly being used. And for maritime patrols in UK waters, that means a far greater likelihood that small boats will begin showing up on a much longer stretch of UK coastline in the year ahead. It'll mean rescue teams across a wider area being called out more regularly to boats that have been in the water for many hours. It does put a lot of pressure on the, the resources, you know, these boats are constructed for one purpose, to shift mass numbers of people, but they're designed, you know, constructed very poorly, they're not expected to be standing up to any real sea conditions, the amount of, of people that they are uh, loaded with. So by crossing from further south and spending longer at sea, every second that they're at sea longer than they need to be is just going to increase that risk and that chance of, of, another, of another disaster. There's little doubt, say maritime rescue experts, that those making small boat crossings from further down the French coast will be at far greater risk with predictions that up to 80,000 people could attempt to cross in the year ahead, authorities on both sides of the channel will be stretched to the limit. Mark White, GB News. Well, joining me now is Tony Smith, CBE, former Director General of UK Border Force. Tony, thank you very much. It's going to go one of two ways, this, I think. We're either going to end up with a lot more people in a lot more unexpected in different parts of the UK, potentially even more deaths in the channel, or they will stop coming. Which way is it going to go? Well, hello, Patrick. Firstly, hats off to Mark White and the GB News team for this report. It's excellent. You guys really do get uh, reporters out on the ground, and I think the public need to understand what's going on. I suspect, I very much suspect the Border Force have this intelligence, but I very much doubt it's in the public domain without this. And I think it's really interesting what Mark has discovered. Um, two points, really. Uh, the fact that the French lifeboats and the French border patrol are very, very active around these beaches further south suggests to me that they're going to have to change their tactics. Because you know, Patrick, they will not intervene uh, on, the, um, uh, on the sea adjacent to Calais uh, and to Dunkirk. Because their line has been that, well, they can't really because, you know, the people don't want to be rescued uh, by the French because they'll be taken back to France. In, in these cases, it's obviously they are being taken back to France, which means that, uh, well, firstly, that, uh, you know, more people are not going to succeed in making the crossing. They're going to, but also I was interested in the fences uh, and the, you know, defences yeah. that have been put up around the beaches in Calais and Dunkirk, Patrick, because we hadn't seen that before. But we have spoken about whether or not the latest tactics by the border force working with the French is working. And it does seem to me that we are at least a bit of a thorn in the side now well, of the human gangs by forcing them in this direction. I, I mean, I think this is potentially very, very good news. Let's be honest. If they didn't have to change their route, then they wouldn't be doing it, which implies that clearly there is now more of a hindrance. We have been sinking a huge amount of money into the French to try to get them to pull the finger out and do a bit more. That's possibly happening now. Fences are at least semi permanent, aren't they? And so that's good. And now if they're having to go to a different location in France, which is going to be either riskier for them to take off, a longer route as well, with less chance of success, just whisper it quietly, are we winning? Well, we've spoken before about whether or not the money we're spending in France is worth it, whether the French are really interested in working with. But this report, to me at least, uh, Patrick, seems to suggest that actually it is working to an extent, isn't it? Now, we haven't seen a reduction in numbers yet. The numbers this year are about the same as they were last year. But it does tell me that uh, it is, it is, we are making it, we are making it hard. We are working with the French. It is harder for them to take the easy route across the Dover Strait. The worry, though, uh, Patrick, whether it's good or bad news, is that I really worry 
that these are even more unsafe uh, routes and more illegal routes. As Mark said in his report, you know, and maritime experts far more qualified than me will tell you that if you're going down as far as Latuque or Fort Marne uh, to board a, and the, and the boats seem to be the same, Patrick, there's been any difference in larger mm. vessels. These are still unseaworthy, that people are going to get into trouble. And I'm, I fear, I really fear more people are going to drown. That's my bit. That's my real worry. Mm. Yeah, I, absolutely. I share that worry with you. And I think they almost definitely are because of the nature of the length of the journey that they're now undertaking. And I suppose one element to it as well will be if there is less success and there is more shocking loss of life as well, does that make it even more likely that people will stop coming? But possibly not. I suppose they could be lied to, couldn't they, about it? But, Tony, thank you very much, as ever. We'll have to talk to you again very soon. Tony Smith there, CBE. Former Director General of UK Border Force, just reacting to that GB News exclusive. Is it actually working, ladies and gentlemen? The money that we're giving the French to do something about the migrant crisis is forcing people to try to change the line of attack, I suppose, really, in a way. But it could also mean, though, that different parts of the UK are going to be seeing some people landing on their beaches in a rather unexpected way. So it could go one of two ways. You're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Next, though, shocking this, actually. Has the blame game started? Lancashire police claim that false information, accusations and rumours are distracting them from their work to find missing mum Nicola Bully. Some would argue they're blaming the public, frankly. And will they? Won't they? Do we even care? Harry and Meghan are yet to decide whether they'll come to the coronation. I can make the minds up for them quite quickly. Don't bother. But now is your headlines. Patrick, thank you. The top story this hour, Rishi Sunak has thanked Nicola Sturgeon for her service. After the First Minister made a surprise announcement, she was to step down after eight years at the top. Ms Sturgeon said she was proud to have been the first female and longest-serving First Minister of Scotland. Ms Sturgeon acknowledged that the move might seem sudden, but she denied it was due to short-term pressures and said she'd been wrestling with the idea for some weeks. Now, to be clear... I'm not expecting violins here, but I am a human being as well as a politician. And the nature and form of modern political discourse means that there is a much greater intensity, dare I say it, brutality to life as a politician than in years gone by. All in all, and actually for a long time without it being apparent, it takes its toll on you and on those around you. The Labour leader has apologised on behalf of the party for its handling of anti-Semitism complaints under his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Sir Keir Starmer also confirmed Mr Corbyn will not stand for Labour at the next general election. The Equality and Human Rights Commission announced it'll end its monitoring of the party two years after finding it responsible for unlawful harassment and discrimination. And Lancashire police today say there's still no evidence to indicate a criminal aspect or third-party involvement in the disappearance of mother of two, Nicola Bully. The 45-year-old has been missing now for 19 days. She was last seen walking her dog along the River Wire after dropping her two daughters off at school. Detectives say Nicola was listed as a high-risk missing person due to a number of undisclosed vulnerabilities. Those are your latest GB News headlines. We're back in half an hour. See you then. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise. with me this Even morning. Even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Surprise. You have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yes. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, for your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. All right, people, apparently this has just dropped. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has outlined a further £25 million in aid for those affected by the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And given his response to Nicola Sturgeon's resignation, we can just play you a quick clip of this now before we move on to other matters. Let's have it. A devastating tragedy that has happened and that we're all seeing. And let me first say thank you to everyone who's given so generously to the deck appeal, uh, raised a huge amount of money. The UK government has uh, already provided considerable aid, but I'm pleased to announce today that we're actually going to provide £25 million further financial support. That's going to go to the United Nations, to British charities, local charities and the Turkish authorities. It's going to provide vital humanitarian assistance on the ground, including medical supplies, tents, blankets, and it comes on top of the support that we've already provided, including 77 search and rescue rescue teams who've been on the ground for a while. But we will continue to do everything that we can to provide help and support on the ground. Um, surprising news to some today, Nicola Sturgeon uh, has stood down. Uh, she's been a towering figure in Scottish politics, uh, survived when four of your predecessors uh, didn't manage to. Can you give us your reaction today? Well, let me first start by paying tribute to Nicola Sturgeon for her long-standing public service and I wish her well in the future. Now obviously Nicola and I didn't agree on everything but in the short time that we did work together I was pleased that we were able to announce two free ports in Scotland. That's joint working between the UK government and the Scottish government. Those free ports are going to attract investment and create jobs in Scotland which is great and I look forward to working with whoever the new First Minister is to continue working constructively to deliver for the people of Scotland. She's been a an incredibly uh, powerful, effective force for uh, independence in Scotland. Without uh, her, is that a huge blow for the independence movement? And conversely, is that a boost, in your view, for the union? Well, I've consistently said that I think what people in Scotland want to see is their two governments, the Scottish government and the UK government, working constructively together on the priorities that really matter to people. And that's about reducing inflation, increasing our energy security, driving growth and creating jobs uh, across the United Kingdom. You know, that's what people's priorities are, and that's what I will continue to do and work on with whoever the new First Minister is. I must say, I do quite like the way Rishi Sunak really struggled to keep a straight face when it came to uh, thanking Nicola Sturgeon for her service there. But we're moving on now, and it's a gear change, this, ladies and gentlemen, because it is the case of Nicola Bully. Where is Nicola? 
There is much speculation as to what has happened to the missing mum, but Lancashire police urgently tried to stop scepticism over the handling of the investigation when they addressed the public earlier. DSI Rebecca Smith outlined her frustration with false information. She's talking about armchair detectives. Here we go. It significantly distracted the investigation. Um, I, in 29 years police service, I've never seen anything like it. Some of it's been quite shocking and really hurtful to the family. Obviously, we can't disregard anything, and we've reviewed everything that's come in, but, of course, it has distracted us significantly. But as long as we are prioritising, which we do constantly, on the information that's coming in, that will not distract us from the priority actions that we have been completing. All right, well, I'm joined now by former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley. He's in the studio for us. Peter, thank you very much. A line stood out for me on this today. She had spe there were specific vulnerabilities of this particular case that meant that she was treated as a high priority missing person early on. Frankly, that has opened up a can of worms, hasn't it? Yes, and uh, the assistant chief constable went on to say towards the end of that press conference that these vulnerabilities were private and personal, and so they weren't going to expand any more on those. But of course, we heard Detective Superintendent Smith saying this speculation was unhelpful. What they've now done is opened a wide set of double doors yeah. for people merely to speculate, um, which is unfortunate, and, and people will. Everybody I come across yeah. asks me what I think about this case. It is the talk of the nation, and mm. that is unavoidable. I'm a bit concerned that it's been a distraction to the detectives, we heard them admit that today, I thought they would be just getting on with the job rather perhaps than pouring over social media. Yeah, talk to me about that, because I, I blustered out to me that. I thought, well, hang on a minute, if it's a few unsavoury characters on Twitter, is that really a distraction for the police? If people have been contacting the police with theories right. and, and their armchair thoughts, then that, of course, would take up some time because an officer would be duty-bound to pour over whatever it was that was sent in. Um, but once again, with the amount of resources that are being deployed to this, I wouldn't imagine it was too much of a distraction. But we saw today quite clearly that both the Assistant Chief Constable and the Detective Superintendent were pretty forthright today. They were pretty firm in what they were saying. I heard somebody else describe her as being... Uh, Detective Superintendent Smith as being aggressive. I wouldn't say she was aggressive at all. I think that's a bit flaky. I thought she was very forthright. She got across what she wanted to do. But, of course, the bottom line is the police investigation still has not no. found Nicola. No, exactly that. And, as well, they're saying, well, the public have... Perhaps if they're causing a distraction, that could, frankly, put people off coming forward, maybe, with evidence. They were doing this mass appeal for evidence and for any information whatsoever, and then all of a sudden we're hearing that, oh, well, sorry, it's been a bit of a distraction. And meanwhile, we've got the family there who seem to be pretty media-friendly, desperate to try to keep this in the media, and it just seems a bit odd. So the police potentially trying to cover themselves a little bit for maybe initial failings? Oh, I think in years to come, when senior officers go on their courses and they have the media input, the disappearance of Nicola Bully and how Lancashire Constabulary have dealt with it will be used as a learning tool. Yeah. And I think part of that will be this is how not to communicate with the press and the public. Now, Peter, I want to dip into your pool of infinite policing wisdom, if that's all right, because here we are, 19, 20 days on, none the wiser, the police still scratching their heads, it would appear, so are the family... We're seeing things out, and there was one in the sun today, for example, about, oh, you know, his, his glove has been found near the scene. Look, whatever comes of that, comes of that. But in your experience, cases similar-ish to this sometimes do get solved, don't they? And, and, and not always in necessarily the most usual of ways. Uh, what would you be thinking now? You, know, you must have some experience of other cases in the past that have been cracked. Well, let's remember, this is still a missing person case. The police went to great lengths today to say there's no evidence of criminal behaviour and there is nothing to suggest the involvement of a third party. So they are really sticking to that line very strongly that they pushed out in the first three days. Mm. Let's just rewind, if we may, to the first three days, the Friday, Saturday and Sunday, when myself and millions of others noticed that there weren't any cordons in place, mm. that the bench hadn't been removed or anything like that. And that is because it was a missing person inquiry. As a senior investigating officer, 
Smith only came on board on the Monday. So that's when kind of detective eyes started pouring over the circumstances and doing the very in-depth inquiries that they've done. We have to let Lancashire Police get on with it mm. and let's hope it comes to some kind of resolution. But they really did reinforce no evidence of crime, no evidence of a third party. If that at any stage proves to be incorrect, then the fallout will be enormous. Yeah, it will be absolutely massive, won't it? And in your experience, Peter, sometimes it can be maybe, I don't know, unusual things or little things that certainly to the untrained eye like myself, I, I, we wouldn't notice. But in the past, you've done things like managed to track people's weekly routes and things, haven't you? And then they've come back on a specific day. It's little little things, isn't it? Can you give us some examples, maybe, in your it, time? It's attention to detail, because that is where the devil resides, as we would always say. It is that attention to detail. One thing that is puzzling me about this is that Nicola was wearing a Fitbit, apparently, a pale blue Fitbit, mm. but that was not synced at the time of her disappearance to any device. Now, the sole purpose, as I see it, of wearing a Fitbit is to monitor your physical activity, the steps you take and any other mm. heart rate, for example, depending on what one you've got. So why unsync that device and still wear it? Yeah. I'd want the answer to that. Now, again, look, I'm not speculating on what's happening here, OK, particularly any more than, frankly, the next man, right? But when you hear things like specific vulnerabilities and when you see that someone... In the case of Nicola, she, she's just vanished, OK? The police seemed on the wiser. And I'm not saying this is what's happened. If somebody wants to go missing, how easy is that to do? Well... Hundreds of thousands of people go missing every year, mm. and quite simply, some people are never found. Um, there are cases dating back many, many years, including children that have gone missing and have never simply been traced. As adults, some people want to leave the, their lives behind and never be found. I've got some breaking news on this right now. Lancashire Police have just come out and said, literally in the last few seconds, that Nicola Bully had suffered significant issues with alcohol. We're going to get more information on that right now. That's the latest line, Peter, just dropping to us live here, that Bully had suffered significant issues with alcohol. So in just a matter of five or six hours from the police saying they are not going to further divulge the personal and private details of her vulnerabilities, yep. now we find them once again flipping that entirely and telling us about that. So that could well be... A statement that the statement goes on to say that the r significant issues with alcohol that Nicola Bully suffered were as a result, as they say, of her uh, dealing with the menopause, apparently. This is just what we're getting to us right live here now. Lancashire Police have uh, introduced this to us now and it has resurfaced in recent months. So, look, what they're basically saying there is Nicola Bully had drink problems and that was as a result of the menopause. Clearly, it would indicate maybe a period of sobriety or, or less of a drink issue. That has now resurfaced, as they say. Does this particularly change...? I'm just going to read a bit of this, actually. So, missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, had in the past suffered with some <coughs> significant issues with alcohol, which had resurfaced over recent months. Lancashire Police have said this in a statement, expanding on what they mean by specific vulnerabilities. Your initial reaction to that, Peter? Yes. Well, unfortunately, I know from not my own experience, but the experience of others, that some people, when they have alcohol issues, can start drinking the moment they wake up, yeah. and really, and drink all day, every day. May she have consumed some alcohol before she went on this walk? We don't know. But again, with this latest news, that has to be a possibility, I would imagine. Um, and does that add some weight? Have the police, of course, known this for getting on for mm. three weeks now? Have they known this from the start? And is this part of what they've known all the time that has again pointed them towards their theory that Nicola went into the water? Yeah, indeed. Uh, and frankly, I think this really does actually change the perception of things uh, because... It may be... I mean, it opens up a variety of different possibilities and people, anyone who 
knows anything about people who can suffer, sadly, with alcohol addiction, etc., will know that the impact that can have on your mental health, it will know that uh, the impact that it can have on behaviour, etc., uh, as well, quickly. Yeah, and there's an important point here, oh. OK? If she's got alcohol problems, she may have been thinking irrationally, so don't try and apply rational thinking to what might have happened. And that's a key point, actually, rightly, rightly said. OK, quick, read this statement again. Missing mother of two, Nicola Bully, had in the past suffered with some significant issues with alcohol which had resurfaced over recent months. So Nicola Bully had suffered some significant issues with alcohol that had resurfaced over recent months. Lancashire Police just bringing us that. Uh, Peter, thank you very much, mate. Great stuff, that. Peter Bluxy, uh, there, former Met detective. Right, you're, you've are you been with me and uh, Michelle is up next. Michelle Jubri is in for Jubes and Co. Yes, gosh, what a significant development, that, Michelle, it must be said. Yeah, it is. You know, what a strange story, isn't it? Uh, obviously, I watched the press conference as well this morning. It's been, I thought, the turn there. Uh, they didn't seem to be happy with those pesky members of the public that have been trying to get involved, did they? I thought that was quite interesting as well. But, you know, when I watch and listen to all of this, obviously, I feel really horrific uh, sadness for her family. But I also can't help but ponder, there are so many other missing people out there as well. Yeah. Uh, do those cases get as much interest and resource, etc., as this one? Uh, and moving on from that story, by the way, is the world controlled by a shadowy, secretive oh. elite? Oh. I want to get into that tonight. Gosh, that's an eclectic mix. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Michelle Jubri coming your way very, very shortly. We're Jubes and Co. I've been Patrick Christie. Thank you very much for everyone who's been watching, listening, emailing in. I'll be back tomorrow, 3pm. Take it easy. Hello, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Rain for some during the rest of today, otherwise bright spells, still some sunshine out there. Overnight, however, the clouds thicken, those clouds bring some rain and drizzle, and it's going to be a mild night. The clouds associated with this trail of weather fronts following the initial front that is moving in, that's moving in against higher pressure, which is situated over the continent by now, and some clear spells ahead of it as we begin the evening, but the rain does push through East Anglia and the southeast, fizzling amounts of rainfall. More widespread rain coming in then from the west overnight. A lot of cloud, low cloud covering the hills, some mist and fog about, and outbreaks of persistent rain and drizzle. Of course, that will keep temperatures up at 6 to 8 Celsius widely across the UK. Northern Scotland, the one exception. Brighter but colder here, a touch of frost to begin things. A windy night to come for Shetland and showers here on Thursday morning. But otherwise, for much of Scotland, it's largely dry. Just some drizzle through the central belt and for the southern uplands. England and Wales get off to a dull and damp start, but the cloud will lift in places, particularly across central areas, where temperatures will reach 13 or 14 Celsius. Staying misty around coasts and hills in the south and the west, and for Northern Ireland, here, a drier interlude before more wet weather comes along by the evening. That pushes into the rest of Scotland and for much of North Wales and northwest England, turning heavier in places, especially towards the northwest of Scotland during the night time. That rain is accompanied by a strengthening wind. So, of course, with the wind and the cloud and the rain, it is a mild night across the board, frost free just about everywhere. The rain sinks south as we begin Friday, but then the winds become an issue. A very windy morning to come, especially for Scotland, for northern England, over the Pennines and just to the east of the Pennines as well. Could be tricky driving conditions with a crosswind for the A1M and for some of those trans-Pennine routes. It turns less windy this weekend, but there'll still be some rain about. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, hello there, it's six o'clock, I'm Michelle Jubery, and this is Jubes & Co, the best debate show in town, that's what I reckon it is. Uh, coming up tonight, Nicola Sturgeon has resigned. Did that shock you, by the way? Did you see it coming or not? Uh, and what do you make to the news? Are you someone that's saying, yes, good riddance when it happens? Or uh, do you think, actually, it's all a shame? Your thoughts, what next as well for Scotland, Britain, independence? And what about the top jobs for women? Can they hack it or not? And in Wales, uh, they've scrapped pretty much all of their major road projects. Why? To protect the environment. It's been called a brave move by some, I can tell you now. Uh, it's been called much worse things by others. Do you agree with it or do you just think it's all a bit much uh, and a war on cars? And do you agree with the following statement? Are you ready? The world is controlled 